Uh, so just to say we've two chairs, one who's actually, if you like, a venue chair, uh, and that's Dev Ram uh, Ramaswamy. And then we've also got uh, Camille Stock, who will be looking after uh, the people online and, and looking at the Slack channel. So it's going to be a bit of a double act and uh, in terms of questions, because we'll have questions from, if you like, outside, as well as from people in the room. Um, so one thing I will ask, I mean, some of you may be tempted to turn on the Zoom link for in the room, but if you do that, please mute your machine, all right? I mean, I know some people are laughing, but some people do that sort of thing. So please do ensure you do that. Okay, um, so yeah, the last thing, I, I remember a number of years back, we had a, a, a meeting in um, Dublin Castle, who was the UK and Irish national astronomy groups getting together for a big meeting. And I started it off by saying, you know, uh, before the speeches, I, I wish to point out the exits, right? So over here and over here as well, and bathrooms are over in that direction. So just to let you know where they are. Um, so unfortunately, as I said, the, the CEO and Registrar of the Institute, she sends her best wishes for this meeting. It's actually the first meeting of DIAS with real live participants since the, uh, the, the, the COVID pandemic. So she's particularly sorry that she's going to, going to miss that. Um, okay, so I think at this point, I'll hand things over to Dev and Camille, and uh, uh, thank you very much. All right, thank you, Tom, for the opening remarks and uh, welcome everyone to Dublin. So I'm going to be the chair. Our first session is going to be on molecular clouds. As the title of the conference is From Clouds to Disk, it's appropriate to start from large scale uh, objects, you know, in parsec scales clouds. And so, before we start, there are a few things also, as Tom was mentioning about uh, how the conference has to blend in together to make sure that participants in person and as well as participants from Zoom are able to uh, uh, make use of the conference. So first thing is that everybody, uh, please, uh, I encourage that you join Slack. So that's where a lot of discussion happens. So please feel, feel free to ask your questions, reference to papers as well as reference to any simulations. You can all put the links in Slack and it's an important channel where all discussions happen. So everybody can participate. This is for in-person as well as for people on Zoom. Then next uh, is that uh, just regarding the timings of each talks. So there are two types of talks in the conference. One is the invited talks. So the invited talks would be for 30 minutes and then five minutes of questions. And then there is the contributed talks. So contributed would be 15 minutes and five minutes of questions. So for the invited speakers, there will be a five minute warning at the beginning, and then there'll be a two minute warning. So uh, the in-person chair here probably will show you the sign in hand to make sure not to interrupt you during the talk. And then also for the contributed speakers, you'll have a two minute warning, just one warning. So we have the AB people there, so they, they take care of all that. <laughs> and regarding how questions are going to be uh, phrased and formulated, so because since it's a blended meeting, we want people also in Zoom, you know, encourage them to also ask the question. So what we will do is in the five minute uh, time for questions, we'll have 50% uh, of the questions coming from the in-person audience. So we have uh, boom mics over there. So there'll be a few people who will come to you. So please wait for the mic to come and then you can ask the question. Then after that, people who are in Zoom, the uh, way you can ask question is raise your hand on Zoom and then our uh, Zoom chair pers person, that's Camille. So she's going to direct the questions. And so we'll make sure that everybody who has a question gets uh, answered within the five minutes. And uh, 
finally, you know, we, as the program stands, we have a coffee break, lunch, and then another coffee break after lunch, and then the welcome reception is at 7 p.m. So uh, we basically have a 30-minute coffee break and a 90-minute lunch break, and the lunch would be served in the Coast Restaurant, uh, which is further on the other side of the hotel. So uh, that's all about housekeeping for the first session. And uh, today, our first speaker is going to be online. So they're going to be, uh, it's going to be Tom Megiat from University of Toledo. He's going to uh, talk about star formation at molecular cl cloud scales and observational perspective. All right, so if uh, Tom is on Zoom, I let uh, Camille, uh, you know, control the Zoom session here. Thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me? Oh. Okay, all good. Okay. All right. Um, well, it is an absolute pleasure to be here. Hopefully everyone can hear me because I'm in the uh, my kitchen at the moment. It's about 5.30 a.m. So not completely coherent, but the coffee is sort of seeping into my brain. So hopefully this, this talk will get better as it goes along. Um, this is... Um, you know, it's a real pleasure to be here to to sort of honor the the achievements of Lee Hartman. Um, I was invited to give a talk on molecular clouds, but since my expertise is really on star formation, um, really the talk is about star formation at molecular cloud scales, which is something Lee has worked in extensively. And I'm going to provide an observational perspective, which will be followed, I think, in the next few talks uh, by theorists. And this is really uh, part of a two decade, uh, I think, collaboration and sort of also just being inspired by papers and works by Lee. And so I call this two decades of tapping into Hartman. Um, and, and actually in honor, we, we're both also sort of, um, you know, like to tap into the insight of the band's final tap. And so I decided that instead of showing an image of a beautiful star forming region on my first slide of this particular talk, I would just start with a black screen. So for all of you that know spinal tap, and this is just the way it should begin. Now, um, I would love to be there right now. Um, and the reason I'm not is not that I, I don't want to travel, but I, I have a Fulbright Fellowship uh, to work with Amy Stutz in a Concepcion Chile. And so this is where I am at the moment. Um, give me a talk. I didn't want to go for five days of quarantine to go to Ireland. Um, but there are beautiful cloud structures here, as you can see. And so this sort of, I think this picture I took last weekend sort of sets the mood uh, for the talk. Um, the also I should say that now that I'm traveling, I, I had to choose like one or two books to go along with me. Um, so this is my astronomy library at the moment, and it's basically a well-worn uh, copy of Lee's book on accretion processes. So you can see that that it's been extensively used um, over the time that I've had it. And, and a lot of that's just due to travel because it's the essential book really on the field. Now um, I'm going to start. Um, by going back to a paper that's that's I guess 20 years old now, um, and you know this is this is a paper that sort of inspired me at a point where I think the whole star formation field was sort of changing, and it was also as I mentioned before before the launch of Spitzer, and so I think this 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 work it was you know part of, I think of a larger body of work, but I think it really sort of um, uh, gave a really beautiful description and tied together various observational and theoretical uh, features of the idea of rapid star formation at molecular cloud scales. And so the paper, of course, is, is uh, from Lee, Javier, and, and Ted Bergen on rapid formation of molecular clouds and stars in the solar neighborhood. And I'm actually going to use this as sort of a touchstone for a lot of the discussion uh, that will follow. And so basically, this talk is a lot of it is riffing off of, of Lee's work, and in particular, riffing off of this particular, not ripping, but riffing off this particular um, work of his from 2001. All right. Now, um, just to give you a, a quick overview of the talk, um, the um, a lot of this is actually drawn from a, a review that I had been writing with uh, Rob Gudemuth, Marina Kunkel, and we submitted it for the PASP. Um, and it, a lot of it does talk about star formation on cloud scales. And so I'm going to start uh, with the um, role of Spitzer. Um, then I'm going to uh, discuss sort of the duration of star formation in clusters and in clouds. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the structure of dense gas in clouds, the kinematics, cluster forming gas, I'm just reading through this, star forming relations, and then maybe a little bit the magnetic fields and feedback, 
right? And so, but all of this is sort of my own sort of stumbling uh, through all of these particular areas. Um, and I'll just take this quote by David St. Hubbins at the bottom as sort of a guide of how you should uh, deal with, with my, my thoughts here. Um, so let's just begin here. So a lot of it goes back to the days of Spitzer. This is um, from the launch of Spitzer. So Lee and I collaborated on Spitzer. I was on the uh, Iraq instrument team. And it, it, you know, it was a real thrill, I guess, over 18 years ago to watch Spitzer launch in this picture. I don't know who took the picture, but I do know that the silhouette of the arm there is Lori Allen raising her arm in, in um, you know, excitement as, as Spitzer launched. And you know, just as a, you know, as a guitarist, if you're at 10, the only way to go up is at 11. For infrared astronomers, the only way to really you know, build upon all the work that had been done up to that time was to launch this, this small but extremely powerful spacecraft. And it's really the work I think that we've done with this that has really, I, th I think revolutionized, it's part of the revolution of our understanding of star formation. Now, I should say uh, to interpret that work required, a lot of what Spitzer did was detecting young stellar objects. And to detect and characterize those young stellar objects that built upon all of this work that, that, that um, Lee and Nuria had done over and, and will be discussed toward the, uh, the second half of this conference. But we, we were basically interested in just saying, okay, this is a young star with a disc, this is a protostar, and then looking at their distribution. And so this is the slide on the very left is a slide that I made back in 2004, showing the Spitzer band passes and models that, uh, that Nuria actually gave us of uh, a star with a disc and a protostar. And you can see how well suited Spitzer was for finding these objects and then uh, Lee and I then wrote an ob a paper of Spitzer photometry of Hartman, of, um, of Taurus um, objects, young stellar objects in Taurus that were well characterized. And we used those to sort of calibrate the colors of these young stellar objects. So we could look at an object and say, okay, this is a pre-main sequence star with a disc. This is a protostar. And it gave us confidence that the um, predictions of the models uh, were correct. Um, okay. Um, so, the once you have all of this ability to detect young stellar objects uh, with Spitzer, uh, then you can start mapping your distribution through the sky. And so here's a region uh, that will appear uh, throughout this talk is some area that, that Lee has worked on extensively. It's the Orion Nebula cluster. Uh, the left is the Spitzer image with the beautiful eight micron emission and then all the little pre-main sequence stars with disks that we identify with Spitzer are marked in little green. Hopefully everyone can see those. Um, and then we actually also augmented this in the center when we had incompleteness with uh, Chandra data from the Coop survey. And so um, all of these space telescopes work really nicely together to create sort of a beautiful senses of objects in these regions. And then, um, then Herschel came along and Herschel allowed us to do two things. It allowed us first to characterize the full SEDs, particularly the protostars, but it also allowed us to map the gas distribution, or really the dust distribution, but, but the dust and gas trace each other. And so here on the right panel is, is the um, large molecular filament that is forming the Orion Nebula cluster, the integral shaped filament from its, uh, you know, from its obvious morphology. And all those circles there are protostars that we have studied. The ones with circled in black are ones that we studied with Herschel and are well characterized. The ones in orange uh, the little dots are things that we detected with Spitzer, which are less reliable, and that's there's some more contamination, right? So now we actually have this beautiful survey of, of young stellar objects uh, distributed through the sky, whether they're protostars or disks, and we can also see, as you can see from this, this map of Stutzen Gold, uh, of Gould, uh, which is basically um, a, a column density map, beautiful maps of the structure of the molecular clouds. So let's go back to the abstract of the 2001 paper. And so it starts with a, a little prologue that says large scale flows in a diffuse interstellar medium have potential for star forming clouds, for forming clouds sufficiently rapidly and for producing stellar populations with ages much less than the lateral crossing times of their host molecular clouds. Now, here I have some maps. These are from the Planck data. Um, uh, extinction maps with uh, young stellar objects overlaid either from um, the Cessna processing of C2D or from Kenyon and Hartman. And you can immediately see that the YSOs follow very tightly in these uh, two nearby clouds, the distributions of the molecular gas. Not gonna surprise anyone here, but obviously that means that they haven't had much time to disperse. 
And so there's little indication, at least on the scales of molecular clouds, of dynamical evolution. Now, um, if you go back to the Hartman 2001 paper, he based much of that on the HR diagrams, where he found that if you look at the HR diagrams and color magnitude diagrams of young clusters, or of, of embedded populations in clouds, I should say, that they were all less than 3 million years old. And if you looked at a population that was over 3 million years old, it was no longer um, on the, um, on, on, it was no longer embedded in a molecular cloud, right? And so it really depended on getting reliable ages and also sort of age spreads at some level uh, for, for these uh, clouds and for these young clusters still embedded in the clouds. Now, um, this is a little bit of a busy slide, but um, I just want to digress a moment that uh, Hartman 2001 and others noted that there are large uncertainties in the age spreads determined from the isochrones on HR diagrams. In fact, the, uh, the age spreads should be considered unreliable. So I just wanted to note that there are alternative methods for looking for the spread of ages just by counting the relative number of protostars and stars with disks in a, a sample of clouds or clusters. And, and so for example, on the left-hand side, I have two clusters, uh, one 1333 and one IC348 from Gudermuth et al. 2009. The red are the protostar, the blacks are the disks. You can see that as clusters age, the disks start outnumbering the protostars. And if you look on the histogram in the bottom right, the histogram is basically that of the disk to protostar ratio for the ensemble of clusters in Gudermuth et al. 2009. And superimposed, I have predictions of models where the star formation lasts two million years and three and a half million years, although with a decline in the three and a half. And you can see that basically that cluster formation to match sort of the distribution of these ratios of disk to protostars in this ensemble of clusters can only persist more than two to three and a half million years. And there's alternative models uh, that use sort of a similar idea uh, that give ages that are even smaller. So the, rain, the duration of star formation in these young clusters is you know, less than three and a half, three and a half million years or less. And then you wanna think about the crossing time argument. Think of the length of the Orion, the entire Orion A cloud. And so here we have the full Herschel map of the Orion A cloud, and we have all of the protostars uh, distributed through it. You can see everywhere where you're looking, there are protostars, right? So things are forming. So this again is a beautiful example of the rapid star formation that whenever there's dense gas, there are stars forming in that. Also, we now know the 3D, 3D shape of this cloud from parallax measurements, first with the VLBA with Marina uh, Kunkel and, and Lee Hartman et al. And then later from Gaia with Kunkel et al. and Grossschädel. Um, and we now know that the, the bottom part of the cloud is further away and that the entire cloud length is about 90 parsecs. It's actually a really long cloud Given the stellar velocity dispersions of about one to two and a half kilometers per second, this means crossing times of 35 to 85 million years, right? So, so it really is that the crossing time is much greater than the actual star forming time in these clouds, at least in the local sort of extended solar neighborhood. Okay, so going on to number two, um, basically once a cloud achieves, um, once a, a, a cloud achieves a high density, uh, to form a high enough density to form H2 and CO, gravitational forces become larger than typical interstellar pressure forces. Thus, star formation can rapidly fo follow rapidly upon molecular gas formation and turbulent dissipation in limited areas of each cloud complex. And as you can see, as I just mentioned in the previous slide, when we look at these clouds, they're filled with star formation, right? There's not many parts. It's rare to find something where there's not much going on, right? So this is, again, uh, sort of a demonstration of this particular uh, rapid star formation that once you form this dense gas, basically it starts collapsing and fragmenting and forming stars. Now, it's actually sort of fun to compare this image of Orion A to this model from Hartman and Burkert 2007, where they just used a collapsing rotating sheet. This is what their collapsing rotating sheet with some sort of clever um, um, initial conditions look like, uh, basically due to rapid sort of gravitational collapse along the edges of the cloud. And you see it actually sort of mimicked very nicely after 2 million years, the overall morphology that we now see in the Orion A cloud, although missing a lot of sort of the substructure. Now, you could actually see that, um, you could actually put the models that sort of came out since 2001, I guess more of the theoretical pictures, into two different camps. And this is a little bit simplistic, obviously, 
Um, but there's the more of the rapid gravity driven star formation, which eventually is added, ended by feedback. And then there's more of a steady state regulated star formation, which um, where the, it's regulated by turbulence. And there's different you know, authors who have promoted these two different thing, these two different sort of um, positions or starting points for their models. Now I'm, I'm an observer here, so I like to follow the wisdom of Derek Smalls that there may be two different, uh, two distinct types of visionaries. It's like fire and ice. Basically as an observer, I feel my role is to be somewhere in the middle, kind of like lukewarm water, right? So here I'm gonna throw some lukewarm water on this whole problem. Now let's go and look at the density structures of molecular clouds. And I think these really show again, the role of gravity. And so on the left is an image, is a Herschel map of the molecular, the Monarch II molecular cloud with the distribution of young stellar objects thrown over. And in each one of those box, uh, Pokerel et al. made um, PDFs of the column densities. And I showed some example PDFs on the right, and you can see the ones where there's no star formation are basically just um, log normal. But the ones where there's our star formation, in particular large clusters, they have this very sort of exponential uh, psi, higher and higher, higher densities. And these, this is basically attributed to gravity. And if you have large clusters, you have these big power law tails. If you have smaller clusters or a diffuse population, you actually can have these broken power laws, uh, which are actually, I don't think, completely understood. But the point is, is that the PDFs are really showing the role of gravity over turbulence at some level. And it's happening where we see lots and lots of star formation. Now, if we look at these two regions, let's just sort of zoom in. This is um, uh, the Monar 2 cluster on the top square and a bunch of filaments forming sort of more distributed star formation, uh, star formation on the bottom. The hub, this, this structure on the top is called a hub. It's about a thousand solar masses. Um, and um, it is, there's gas flowing into it. This is the work, work by Rainer et al, 2017. And it's forming a massive rich stellar cluster. And this is sort of a morphology that's seen often in clusters where you have sort of a hub with filaments um, radiating outward and those are actually feeding it. Down toward the bottom, we have more of the sort of uh, filamentary picture of star formation where you see these sort of filaments that are roughly to 0.1 parsec width, which has often been found for these. And they have you know, modest uh, densities that are high enough for more of a distributed star formation. So it's almost like sort of two little modes of star formation, the sort of super filamentary mode and this hub mode. Although that's probably an overstatement as you will see. Now, it's, it's common to say that all massive star formation happens in hubs, but there's also these structures like the ISF, which you might call a filament, but are often called ridges in the literature, which are super high mass to length ratio filaments. For example, the, inter the ISF, which I'm showing you on the left, the integral shape filament, has a mass uh, to length ratio of, of over of several hundred. So it's not clear if these things are really very high mass to length filaments, or are these more like flattened hubs that may have collapsed into this, this configuration? It should be noted that these ridges have very different density cross sections than other filaments. This sort of more typical filaments that you might see in Taurus, although some may, may actually disagree with this. And they actually have substantial internal structures like fibers and filaments. And there's sort of a debate over that that you can follow in the literature uh, from, from the work of Alvaro Hakar and others, uh, which is really fascinating. Now, these ridges are also very kinematically complex. And so here's, here's um, uh, some work from um, Gonzalez Lobos and Stutz, uh, where on, we have these panels and we're sort of looking at the properties of, the, of, the, uh, of this cloud as a function of declination. It's lined up beautifully in sort of a north-south direction, makes life easy. And you can sort of see on the, the, the left, sort of the mass to length ratios for gas and stars. It's interesting that the gas always dominates except at the very center of the Orion Nebula cluster, where there's probably been a lot of gas dispersal, there has been. If you look at the velocity dispersion in N2H plus and ammonia, you actually see that it can be incredibly structured. And in fact, one of this, this in, in, in addition to this sort of small scale structure, there's this large uh, gradient that's seen north of the Orion Nebula cluster where the velocity goes to bluer and bluer shifted uh, velocities. Now, where do these motions come from? Are there, there's, you know, you can, you can find different, um, um, in the literature that they're attributed to rotation, to oscillations, to infall. Um, there's a, there's a, a paper uh, by, by Hawker et al, which attributes this gradient to infall into the Orion Nebula cluster. Um, and there's actually also work that, that we did with uh, John Tobin and Marina Kunkel, and also Eva Proskow, 
where they sort of also explained emotions of the stars, which were measured through radial velocity measurements as falling into the Orion Nebula cluster. Now, for that to happen, the filament has to be oriented in a way that, that uh, it's sort of tilted so that the upper part, the northern part, is pointed away from the Earth, as in my diagram uh, to the right here. It is interesting that if you look at Gaia measurements, and Gaia is tough to use in this, this cloud, so you, you may take this with a bit of a grain of salt, but all the works that work has, that has been done uh, finds that the central part, the Orion Nebula cluster, might be the center part of it, maybe a little bit more distant than the rest of the filament. And so the morphology may look a bit like this, and this would then mean that that motion there, if this configuration is right, um, as, as shown in this um, work, Stutz et al. 2018, Getman et al. 2019, then it means that that motion may not actually be infall, right? So we really need to get the three-dimensional structure worked out, and Gaia right now is pointing to a structure that is more bent like this, with the center of the Orion Nebula cluster a little bit further. Now here's looking into the velocities of the individual cores, the work at Kong et al. from the Karma survey. So this is the integral shape filament, again, with velocity in the y direction and position declination in the x direction. Again, you can see in this C18O position velocity diagram, the beautiful structure with the Orion Nebula itself right in the center with gas being blown out. The blue is basically the velocities of cores as measured in ammonia. And they do an analysis where they look at, they estimate what the virial velocity would be based on the, the uh, mass to length, um, the mass to length ratio for the molecular gas, which dominates the gravity, which is about 0.83 kilometers per second. And then they look at the core to envelope velocity dispersion. How much are the cores moving relative to the C18O gas? And they find that it's subvirial, 0.35 kilometers per second. But then on the other hand, if you just take the core to core dispersion, or how fast all these cores are moving relative to each other, because of this velocity structure, that is actually 2.92 kilometers per second, which would be super virial. All right, hopefully everyone can hear me now. There's a little bit of noise on the, uh, the microphone. All right, uh, nobody's complaining, so I'm hoping I'm being, this, my connection is still good. I just wanna mention, I'm just gonna drop through this really quickly. Somebody may ask if they have questions because I'm running a bit slow, but it's, it's, I think one really interesting question is how do these initial velocities of these cores in this complicated motions of the filament then lead to a cluster, uh, which at the moment from Gaia shows no hint of expansion, rotation, or contraction, although that may change, um, and where the gravity is still dominated by the filament. And so I don't think we have a really good understanding of how the, this, these motions uh, lead to sort of the observations of the, of the dynamics of the clusters uh, that have been made with Gaia. So I'll just, I'll just go with there. Now, if you go and, and dive down now in, a little bit more into the, um, in, into the, the substructure, here we have a, a 350 micron map from Thomas Stanka. It shows all that the, the filament, um, the integral shape filament has these beautiful structures, wispy, often with, with um, diameters that at least on, appear to be less than 0.1 parsecs, which has been argued by um, Hakar et al. Uh, and the red, the, the little circles are protostars with the youngest protostars, the red ones being the class zero objects. Um, and the, the oldest ones, the yellow being the flat spectrum sources. And it's actually really interesting going back to the motions that by the time we have a flat spectrum sources, they tend to not to be correlated with the dense gas structures anymore. They're either dissipating them or they're moving or the structures are moving. And so this is also really sort of points to this very structured, dyna dynamic, highly structured environment within these ridges. Okay, so let me go to um, do a quick switch now, is now we, we looked into the details of this one uh, uh, ridge, this one region, the Orion Nebula cluster. Let's step back and look at a whole bunch of star forming regions and see if we could find star forming laws, right? So we, we, the idea is that in rapid star formation that once you have gas, you immediately start forming stars, once you have dense cold molecular gas. Let's sort of measure how that properties of the dense gas correlate to the properties to the rate of star formation. Now, I'm not gonna go, I just wanna sort of touch on this slide is that we, once we have the number of young stellar objects, we can estimate uh, a star formation rate simply by taking the number of young stellar objects and dividing by the typical lifetime of those young stellar objects. Or we can take the number of protostars and divide by the standard lifetime of those protostars if you wanna just look at the younger population. You can also use the integrated luminosities of those, but I don't wanna go into that at this moment. 
Now, a number of authors have started doing this when he looked at actually at the correlation of the column density of gas to the column density of young stellar objects. And, and uh, some of this work goes back to Gutermuth et al. 2011, who found that there was a strong correlation between the column density of stars and the column density of gas. And there's been subsequent work that has um, improved upon that. This is the most recent work by Pokerol et al. 2020, <coughs> where they did a, a, um, a very careful job of getting rid of regions where there were gas dispersal, which are the little circles uh, without, without, that are not pink. And when they do that through a range of regions from low mass star forming regions like Ophiuchus to high mass star forming regions like Monar 2, they all follow this correlation where the, the stellar density of gas goes as the, um, uh, the, the column density of gas goes as, this, I'm sorry, the column density of stars goes as the column density of gas squared. And they interpret this is basically that the star formation rate per area um, is proportional to the column density of gas squared, right? So the star formation rate is increasing rapidly with the column density. And actually this would also mean that the efficiency of star formation would correlate linearly with the column density of gas, right? And the interesting thing is the power law that we get from this correlation now with this really beautiful work uh, by Pokerol et al is all around two uh, all around two, right? Two with, with a very small dispersion, right? So all these clouds are very consistent. Now I should just mention that um, I talked a little bit to how, you know, you might have almost a, a bimodal star formation, but this is basically a continuum where the low end, you know, low column density areas are giving you very dispersed star formation and the very high column density regions are giving you clusters with high efficiency, right? So it gives you sort of a nice way of explaining why clouds have both distributed low density populations and, and high density populations of stars, um, just because it's basically due to variations in the column density. Now there's an alternative way of, of formulating this. Um, and uh, this is um, a, another paper by Pokerol et al. And um, this is the idea, what the, norm, the original law is shown on the left, where we, again, we show the star formation rate per column density versus this, the, the uh, column density of gas, right? And this is basically where it goes to the column density squared. But you can see that every cloud is a little bit different. So even though we have a star formation law uh, that works within one cloud and that uh, every cloud seems to have the same exponent. So if you follow these lines here, like the black line, the orange line, the blue line and what, whatever, um, each one of those is, is basically from a different cloud that's given on the left. There's a large dispersion there. But an alternative thing is that you divide the, uh, the column density of gas by basically the local free fall time. And this requires um, an estimate of the density, which is always a little bit tricky to get. But the idea is now you're getting a star formation rate per free fall time. And when you do that, you get the plot on the right side, um, where now you have a linear dependence between the star formation rate per area and, this, um, and the column density of gas, right? And not only do you have a linear, um, but you actually, uh, a linear dependence, which makes life easy because now you can go from a column density to a volume density law, where the volume density of YSOs is proportional to the volume, uh, the volume density star formation rate is proportional to the volume density of the gas. But you also have a small dispersion between all the individual clouds. Right, and this whole process is characterized by an efficiency per free fall time, um, which is about 0.25 from this work. And there's a small dispersion in this, the log dispersion is about 0.18. So this particular formulation of the law reduces basically the scatter between clouds. Um, it says that column densities can be replaced with volume densities simply because it's a linear relationship. So you can divide out the depth very nicely. Um, what's really impressive is that it's basically equivalent for low and high mass star forming clouds. And it, it's not clear, but it may be an issue for some rapid star formation scenarios, because at some level you have to sort of create this sort of regulated star formation um, between all of these different clouds. And um, I wish I could be up there speaking right now so I could see the, you know, whether people are nodding or shaking their heads. Um, but in, in the paper at all, they suggested that um, you need to, to basically regulate star formation in a way that is consistent between clouds that form high and low mass stars. And so high mass st stellar feedback can't be the answer to everything. Um, and so in the paper, they suggest um, 
um, star formation regularly made turbulence B fields and outflows from low mass stars may lead to this very consistent relationship. Um, but it's something we need to explain. It's observationally there. Um, it is now up to the theorists to provide, you know, to put that on a firmer uh, sort of theoretical basis with, with simulations and such. Okay. Um, how much time do I, I got a few, a few minutes left. Okay, good. So this, I'm just gonna go over these two topics very quickly. Um, going back, if everyone remembered, I started with the Hartman et al. 2001 abstract, and I'm gonna continue that. Um, there's a number three, where he said, typical magnetic fields are not strong enough to prevent rapid star, a rapid cloud formation and gravitational collapse. And he, here's just, I wanted to point out this beautiful example uh, uh, by Pillai et al. 2020 using Hawk Plus on Sophia, where they took the Serpens South cluster, one of the clusters discovered uh, by Gudermuth et al. Uh, with Spitzer, and they measured the magnetic field directions uh, through far infrared polarimetry. And you can sort of see the directions they're given on this one map on the left, it's the Spitzer images, but you can sort of see the, the field directions. And then you can see the column density map um, with the field directions on, on this um, uh, overlaid as, as vectors. And you can see that the, the field is perpendicular to the filament uh, where the densest star formation is actually happening in the densest part of the, one of the denser regions of the clump. But there's also parts where there's filaments where the magnetic field is actually parallel to this. And it, it, one of the interesting things is that you have this one filament that seems to be feeding into this hub. It may be actually channeling gas to this, but it has a very high magnetic field. Uh, the gravity is still dominating, but it has a high magnetic field because gravity has basically squashed it, is I guess my observer interpretation. It's also fun that if you go back to the Hartman 2001 paper, um, he mentions both of these sort of configurations. There's the perpendicular figuration where you have a layer of molecular gas, material streaming into it, growing in the magnetic field sort of along, um, perpendicular to it. And that was one that was conducive to star formation. And then there was one where the magnetic field gets sort of bent and amplified uh, by a shock as gas is basically swept up. And in that case, he was, um, he, he, he thought that maybe there wouldn't even be molecular gas forming. But now in the densest molecular gas, in very dense regions of molecular gas, we actually find magnetic fields parallel to filaments. So you can get both perpendicular and parallel. And it, it's a neat, it just shows you sort of the power of, of some of the new polarimetry uh, coming from SOFIA. Let me go on to the fourth one, scooting through magnetic fields as rapidly as possible. Um, the rapid dispersal of gas by newly formed stars, passing shock waves, and reduction of shielding by a small expansion of the cloud after the first event of star formation might limit the length of the star formation epoch and the lifetime of a cloud in its molecular state. And, and here's um, a, a, a sort of, this is what explain the low star formation efficiencies of molecular clouds and clusters as well. This is a plot from the review of, uh, of McGath, Gudermoth, and um, Kunkel. Uh, the squares, I didn't put a key here, but the squares are molecular clouds. And you can see they all have about a star formation um, uh, efficiency of around 3%. This is an instantaneous star formation efficiency, not the final one. That uh, the clusters, which are circles, have a wide range, but tend to be on the order of like um, of around 20%. And then it's been claimed that molecular cores have ones that are actually higher up here. And they're all actually off by about a factor of three increases. But the main point is that clouds, and to a lesser extent, clusters, and, and to a great extent, the Orion B cloud are super inefficient, and you need to find some way of keeping that inefficiency. And part of that, what, part of that is basically feedback, that the clouds are destroyed by the stars they form. Now, this is not a new idea. Um, it's, it's, it's a long-held idea that actually goes back to Herbig, I think, in the, in the 60s and 70s. But it's beautiful now we can actually measure this feedback directly. There's these um, papers. Uh, by Cornelia Pabst, where they used the upgrade um, instrument on SOFIA to map the uh, C2, so the atomic car uh, the, the ionized carbon distribution. In uh, the Orion region, you can actually see in this, the C2 map looks very similar to the Spitzer map with all the nebulosity. And they find bubbles. Um, you can actually see in this, the plot to the left, there's three circles that are bubbles that are basically being blown by mass of the intermediate mass, well, I guess O to B stars. And, um, and they've actually can measure the amount of gas in these bubbles and the expansion speeds because they also have velocities. And they find evidence that there's a large windblown bubble extending from uh, the stars in the Orion Nebula, as well as more H2 region driven bubbles 
surrounding NGC 1977 and M43. And so we're really now show, finding these bubbles and actually showing that they're, they seem to be at least at first glance, really young, like with ages less than a million years, that this, this uh, feedback has happened very recently. But I think the bigger issue is now that we can quantify this. Okay, so I'm gonna end here um, uh, with this little quote by David St. Hubbard, we'll let you read. Um, but I think the thing I just wanted to point is that the rapid gravity driven star formation uh, that was you know, sort of you know, put forth by Hartman and all 20, 2001 and others really I think is the, the um, almost dominant paradigm at the moment of uh, maybe it is the dominant paradigm that we're all sort of working in. Um, and there's a lot more work to be done that, that builds and elaborates on that you know, original sketch that we had. Um, I think it's really interesting now that we need to sort of better understand the structures of dense gas in the molecular clouds. And of course that's the area of, of huge effort at the moment as going to finer scales with ALMA. We have identified star forming relations with Spitzer that are getting more and more robust at time. And they do seem to suggest that there is some sort of regulation of star formation and maybe a role for jets. And so maybe we have to sort of mix our models a bit more. And then there's these complex motions on multiple scales. And our best example of a massive uh, star forming ridge, the ISF, and I think understanding you know, what drives these motions and how they translate into the dynamics of clusters um, is super important. And then finally, I think observations are now really improving our understanding of magnetic fields and feedback. And I will end that and um, I will await questions. All right, thank you. Yeah, any questions? Uh, from... All right, we have two questions from in person. Uh, first question to Lee. So Tom, uh, Tom I, I appreciate the, uh, the quotations. Um, <laughs> two, two things, in terms of the magnetic field geometry, I think one needs to be a little careful because we're, we're not seeing the 3D structure. And sometimes you can get stuff that wraps around and it looks like it's more mm -hmm. parallel than it actually. So in terms of the infall, uh, you know, if you have a big uh, mass in the ONC, you can get a big velocity dispersion. And the question is, why don't we see the red shifted part, right? Uh, yeah, because we just kind of see the blue shift. Can there be some kind of extinction explanation for that? I, I, I don't. Yeah, I mean, it's also interesting that if, if you actually look at the um, I think I'm showing the um, the slide, hopefully everyone can see that of the uh, from the Conga all paper. Yeah, the north, you see that to the north of the cloud, which is to the left, you see that strong gradient. Uh, but to the right, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's fairly constant in velocity. So you don't see the opposite. So that might be another issue with the infall. I mean, as I said, the one part of the infall is that the inclination of the, um, the best we can determine with ice with, um, with uh, Gaia is not the right inclination for it to be infall. And then the second issue is that toward the south, we don't also see the infall either. So that, I mean, that's a really good question. And I, I think we just don't understand the motions of what's, what's driving these motions in there. Is it, maybe it's not just purely gravity, but um, yeah, I, 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 you know, I don't want to speculate further. But, but there are, you know, it, it is a complex velocity field and it doesn't simply fit into just the idea that it's all driven by, by inward motions to the central gravity, I guess would be my point. I'm muddying the waters here. All right, other questions yeah. in uh, Zoom? So we'll take one question from Zoom. And we can... Yep, so we have a few questions from Slack and a few, yep, from Slack. So the first one is from Adam Ginsberg. If you want to unmute, you can ask your question. I'm actually here. Oh, oh. Mike, Mike. Hi. So my question was a clarifying one um, that you quoted that epsilon free fall of 0.25. Uh, and I was wondering if that differed from uh, why that was so different from other ones quoted. But uh, I already got an answer in the chat that it looks like that might have been that the, the one in the paper might be 0 0.025. Uh, yeah, you when, you, when you said 0.025, I'm going to go edit this. I'm really sorry about that. But uh, yes, um, it is 0.025. It's, it's actually quite small. It's about 2%. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, this is, I, I guess I, um, yeah, thank you for that. That was actually um, uh, a nice clarification. It's only a few percent. Right, we'll have a last question from Enrique. Yeah. Hi, Enrique. Uh, hi, Tom. Uh, so uh, actually, uh, first, uh, super brief comment. I think our simulations of filament accretion 
reproduce the kind of kinematics that uh, you have shown very well, so we can discuss that. But my actual question here is, or, or comment is that concerning the regulation of star formation, you mentioned uh, that it possibly called for uh, the action of turbulence, magnetic fields and outflows. But actually, mm -hmm. uh, an important uh, point to consider is the evolution and the acceleration of the star formation uh, over the lifetime of a cloud. And so that tends to explain also the, both the, the tail of uh, older objects that you always see in these clusters. And, and also, uh, in a paper in 2018, we showed that a sample of clouds with a dispersion of star formation efficiencies can be, could be understood as the consequence of these clouds be, uh, having different ages and therefore being at different rates of star formation. Right, right. So but, it also, yeah. the acceleration of star formation may be a point to consider here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so one, one um, yeah. So, you know, I, I actually just sort of stumbled into this this theorist discussion on, on dispersions of, of uh, star formation efficiencies and such. But I, I think the point of the the, the paper, the poke roller paper, is that actually, you know, first the, the efficiency for star formation is is relatively small. So only about two and a half percent of the um, uh, of the stars are basically gas is being converted into stars um, every free fall time. Um, and it's not accelerating. That's sort of a constant number that seems to be the same uh, from cloud to cloud to cloud. So the first idea is that this is sort of a, a constant that, that is invariable with time. And so some of the papers I know show sort of an acceleration or increase with that. Um, but at least the, the, I, the interpretation that we have of that is that it's not. And then the other thing is that the dispersion in the efficiency for free fall time that we find uh, for this data is much smaller than what has been claimed for sort of cloud scales by, um, by Lee et al and um, uh, Murray and such. And so we're actually claiming that, the, that this dispersion is actually a lot smaller than people had thought. And so maybe we don't need this sort of acceleration in the uh, uh, efficiency for free fall that some of those models uh, predict. Um, and so I, 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 yeah, I think sort of the idea is that this argues maybe that, 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 that accelerate, that there might be an acceleration, but there's not a change in the acceleration of the efficiency for free fall time. So. And that's correct because the free fall time also becomes shorter as the cloud evolves. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. But, but there's some, some papers that claim the efficiency for free fall time also scales, you know, increases with time. And, and that we don't really see much evidence for. Uh, all these clouds are relatively consistent, um, except for, you know, there's a little bit of scattering, so there's a question of, of whether it's intrinsic or not, or it's measurement error. Um, but you know, it's it's interesting that Orion A of all clouds is sort of the the slacker on this thing. It's sort of sitting below everything else. So there's obviously more to do here, and and getting to densities and freefall times is not straightforward. So, um, but it's sort of pointing to I, I think a thing that that's a little bit discrepant with some of the the papers on sort of you know rapid collapse and such. All right. All right, thank you, Tom, once again for the review talk. Uh, next, we have uh, Enrique Vasquez uh, for a contributed talk. He's going to, uh, his title of talk is Understanding Multiscale Gravitational Collapse Flow. So you can probably show your simulations how that relate to Tom's data. They weren't quite here to Tom's talk. <laughs> um, just a few things to add as well. For anyone who sent questions on Slack, um, I would encourage Tom to go there and answer them when he has a bit of time and you guys can continue the discussion because we weren't able to reach all the questions this time. Okay, well, uh, it's a pleasure being here and celebrating Lee's career. Uh, I'm really happy to, to have the opportunity here because he's both uh, a great friend and also he has been the spark that has triggered many of the ideas uh, or the fundamental ideas that uh, are going to be shown here. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, yeah, so what I was saying, and I think what's most important is that Lee uh, turned on the spike, you know, he started the spark that triggered all the ideas that I'm going to be mentioning here. So thanks a lot for that. Um, here's a list of my collaborators and you will see their names popping up uh, uh, over the talk. And let me tell you how this whole uh, uh, quest started. It was about 17 years ago at a meeting in Spinetto um, on the IMF celebrating the 50th anniversary of, um, of the IMF. And I was chatting with Lee there. And back then, uh, I don't know if he remembers this, but he, uh, it, it, it is perfect. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll remind it for you. Uh, so you were telling me, you know, Enrique, I'm just going back to the basics. I'm just doing gravitational collapse. Back then, my soul was sold to turbulence. And so I was thinking to myself, oh, poor Lee. I wonder what happened to him. Everyone knows it's turbulence. Yeah, that's uh, Well, uh, as, as, as time would have it, about a decade later, I was sitting at this conference in the Epos, uh, in the Epos Castle, in the Epos meeting, sorry, the Ringberg Castle, the Epos meeting, and it was me saying, oh, you know, it's global gravitational collapse in molecular clouds. And Paolo Paduan sitting next to me at the table, uh, he said it out loud. But Enrique, what happened to you? You know, it's, it's like I had bumped my head and he was really concerned that I had lost my mind or something. So here's what happened. See, here's what happened ever since. Uh, I had planned to first tell you a little bit about how and why I switched uh, from turbulent support and all, any form of support for molecular clouds uh, and instead, uh, instead turned to gravity and gravitational collapse. But unfortunately, I won't have time for that, but I'll be happy to discuss it with you during the conference. And instead, I'm just going to go and, um, and discuss how this mechanism seems to work. What have we've been finding in the last decade or a little bit over that. And I'll start with, uh, with the classic works. Uh, I don't see, oh, there's a cursor. So with the classic works by, from over 60 years ago, and then work my way uh, into the present. So, uh, so this is a part that I won't have time to show you, but I, just, I would just like to show you one of our most recent simulations of a molecular cloud formation. It's very important to take into account the whole history of the molecular cloud evolution. And uh, um, because you need to take into account how it forms, where does it get its turbulence from? And then what happens to it when it gets stars that are able to uh, disperse it? So this is the, a simulation by Manuel Zamora Viles from a couple of years ago, including uh, where a cloud is formed by a compression in the WNM and it includes magnetic fields it includes cooling from the warm gas to the cold gas, and it includes uh, stellar feedback from in the UV form. And you see that when the cloud forms, it develops all these filamentary structures. It forms stars, it develops, and it and then when the massive stars form, it, the cloud gets blown away, just like uh, Lee and and his collaborators predicted in 2001. And uh, and. And this happens very early in the history of a cloud. So a very small fraction of the cloud's mass is able to make it into stars before it gets destroyed. That's a, that's a key issue. Okay, so how, how does the mechanism work? And it was uh, 70 years ago almost that Ho Fred Hoyle um, told us that he realized that the G's mass, which is a function of the, uh, which goes like the density to the minus one half power to uh, times the temperature to the three halves power for isothermal clouds decreases with increasing density. And this means that as a cloud contracts and its density increases, the G's mass decreases. And therefore, uh, as a cloud contracts, uh, the number of G's mass it contains increases just by the fact that the G's mass is decreasing itself. And, and this continues, then you have secondary collapses and the story repeats itself. And then you have collapses within collapses. And we have described this in detail in a paper from a couple of years ago. So, um, then there were some concerns about whether this mechanism could really operate because there were simulations in the 70s and the 80s uh, saying that uh, for a cloud that had just a marginal uh, mass uh, above the genius mass, so that it was just marginally unstable, uh, then the largest uh, scales would collapse faster than the smaller scales and those op thus overwhelm the collapse of the smaller scales and so they, there won't, wouldn't be any time for fragmentation. But these concerns actually don't apply to real molecular clouds because they, don't, they are not marginally unstable, they're largely unstable. They contain many, many genes masses. There are nonlinear turbulent density fluctuations. That means that they do have shorter freefall times to begin with. They don't have to wait to grow from the linear stage. And then the clouds are not spherical. In general, they're filamentary or they're flattened. They are expected to be flattened because they are formed by compressions and compressions give you sheets. They don't give you spheres. So simulations that start with spheres are omitting the fact of how the clouds form in the first place. Okay. Then Lin and company in 1965 told us that uh, 
when a cloud contains many genes masses, basically they uh, studied the case of uh, pressureless collapse. Then they found that the gravitational collapse amplifies the, uh, the, the non uh, sorry, the anisotropies. And so that an, an ellipsoidal cloud will, oops, would uh, collapse uh, into a sheet and a sheet would then collapse into a filament. So uh, then that means that uh, gravity and amplifies anisotropies. And this is what we expect uh, to happen for clouds that contain many genes masses like molecular clouds and that are flattened. So then if the clouds are already flattened to begin with, then we expect filament formation. This is another simulation um, of this kind that I showed before. This one does not have stellar feedback nor magnetic fields, but it clearly shows how a cloud that is born turbulent, let me go back to show it to, from the beginning. You see the cloud is turbulent, but the formation of the filament is gravitational. Everything is just collapsing into the filament. And then the filament continues the collapse flow into the hubs. Mm -hmm. So uh, the filament, and this is one very important take home message that I would like you to, to get is that uh, gravitational contraction produces a flow. It's not an isolated event that happens at one moment at one time. Mm -hmm. So what does this filament, uh, filamentary flow uh, uh, look like? Well, in my mind, it looks closest to a river. So the filaments work like rivers. They are taking the mass from the shallow parts of the gravitational potential to the deep parts of the gravitational potential, just like in the river. And just like a river flows from the, uh, collects matter from the mountaintops and it uh, goes into the lake. So the filaments uh, collect matter from the molecular clouds and drive it into the hub. Mm -hmm. And that means that filaments are not hydrostatic objects. They should not be modeled like hydrostatic objects. They are <clears throat> instead an accretion flow from the cloud scale to the hub scale. Mm -hmm. And also because they are flow, a river doesn't, run, uh, doesn't stop when it runs out of water. It just keeps collecting mass from the mountaintops. So just the, the, the filament lasts for as long as it can accrete mass from its surrounding cloud. So the time scale, the lifetime of filaments and hubs is not the, the lifetime of their, their collapse time, is the, the time scale over which they can accrete mass from the next larger scale. Mm -hmm. So what is the consequence of this, uh, of this mechanism? For example, in a paper from uh, last year with Alejandro Gonzalez Samaniego, uh, we were looking at the evolution of clusters in, in, a, in one of these clouds. And then what we were looking at was at the mass, at the gas mass contained in spherical regions around uh, the center of mass of the cluster. And in spherical regions of radius r, and when the uh, at various uh, radius radii are right, so this first plot on the left is the gas mass in a sphere of radius r um, for these different radii and for two different simulations, one with feedback in which the stuff from the, the gas is blown away by the feedback, and another one without feedback in which the gas just continues to accumulate. Well, then we compare that to the mass, to the stellar mass in the same spherical volume. And oops, sorry. And for that, and here you see that the mass in stars for the non-feedback simulation just keeps going up, as you would expect. For the feedback simulations, it turns back down at the uh, location of the central parts and it stabilizes at more in, more in larger regions. But the most important thing is that the mass increases in, by the hundreds the stellar mass increases by the hundreds, but the gas mass increases by the thousands of solar masses. So that means that the hub mass uh, uh, increases faster than the stellar mass, even when it is already forming stars. So what does that mean? First, the first consequence is that it maintains a low observed instantaneous star formation efficiency. If you define it by the stellar mass divided by the gas mass plus the stellar mass, because the gas mass is increasing faster than the stellar mass, this number doesn't go up. In fact, it might even go down. Uh -huh. And so even for the non-feedback simulation, we continue to measure at the end a, an, a, an instantaneous star formation efficiency of only about 6% and a little bit lower for the simulation with feedback. But this is, so accretion here plays a fundamental role of making the mass of your, ga, of your, of your cloud not a constant, but instead it, it evolves in time. So the conclusion is that clumps gain mass faster than they can put it into stars. 
But how does this happen? You know, when, when we first saw this in the simulation, I was even afraid that the simulation was wrong. So how, how could it be? What was holding up the mass in the cloud instead of allowing it to go into the stars directly? Then we were doing a um, la this very this last this same year we were we came up with this paper uh, which is an analytical study of the transient so this is a transient stage the prestellar stage of uh, evolution of a core in spherical geometry so just back to the basics like Lee taught me uh, for 17 years ago back to the basics uh, a, a, the we did the collapse of a spherical core uh, and modeled it as a time varying power uh, slope, power law slope for the density. So this is, for example, the classical uh, simulation of uh, Larson in 1969. And you see that the density increases at the center over the pre-stellar stage. And so we model that as a sequence, as a temporal sequence of different power laws uh, with a slope that varied in time. So this was our modeling for that. Mm -hmm. And then what did, we, uh, what did we do in addition? We assumed that the velocity was just the gravitational velocity, just like uh, Wang Xing Li did in a paper from 2018. And that was uh, very interesting. So this is just the, the gravitational velocity driven by the mass contained every radius, uh, within every radius. And then from the, from the hydro equations, we were able to derive the evolution equation for the, uh, for the exponent in the density uh, in the power law density profile. So the exponent is P, and this is the time evolution of P. And never mind this, uh, these factors on the right-hand side, the sign of this equation is, the sign of this derivative is just given by P itself. And you can see that the sign is larger than, than it is positive when P is less than one, and it is negative when P is larger than one. What this means, is that if P is less is less than than two, sorry than two, if P is less than two, then uh, P increases. But if P is larger than two, then P decreases. So P equals two is an attractor. The slope of the uh, of this uh, power law core, power law density profile for the core, is an attractor at P equals two, and uh, and also as Lee showed. The accretion rate is independent of radius at p equals two, but at p less than two, the accretion rate uh, uh, chokes uh, causes the gas to choke along the way. So not all of the mass that is accreted by the core in the outer part makes it to the central parts because part of it sort of uh, stagnates in along the way and it gets accumulated by the core. This is just a feature of gravity. Gravity is not being able to put all the mass at the center at the same rate that it is accreting from the outside if P is less than two. Uh -huh. And so this allows the core's mass to grow even while form, uh, even if uh, the core is already forming stars. So it's not 100% efficient in depositing the mass at the center. Then uh, in that same paper, we collected a sample uh, um, of the observed cores and what were uh, which had their uh, slopes reported, and we found that in general they have slopes less than two. So in general, cores can accrete uh -huh, and and retain some of the mass, and therefore they their masses can grow. Uh huh. Uh, their their core the cores masses grow faster than their stellar masses. Another very important thing here, which I won't go describe in detail, but it's, it's just that. For P less than two, for a, a density profile shallower than minus two, then there's always a central part that looks gravitationally stable. That is, the central part always looks pressure confined, but it is not really pressure confined. It is ramp pressure compressed, compressed or crushed. So the central part of the core is, is just not locally self-gravitating, but it's just increasing its density because the rest of the cloud is falling onto it. Finally, I just wanted to point out that the below, that this type of collapse is from the outside in. It's not inside out like we were taught in in, in graduate school. It's outside in. The collapse starts from the uh, from the from the gene's length, and then it works its uh, its work inwards. So it works its way. Sorry. Uh, so I can't find the the pointer here. Uh, here it is somewhere. Well, just uh, you can see the the 
plot on the right is the velocity profile over time. So at different times, the peak of the velocity it gets higher, but it also gets closer to the center of the core. So the collapse is outside in from the gene's length onwards. And so this constitutes an outside in collapse. Finally, I would just like to say that in more realistic turbulent and non-spherical clouds, then there are turbulent motions that, uh, I can't find my, my pointer, but anyway, there are turbulent motions that apply, imply a residual angular momentum, which then needs to be removed from the clumps in order for the collapse to continue. And this uh, material removal that takes away some of the angular momentum is, uh, causes the process to always consist of a fragmentation process. It's not just a, a monolithic collapse, it's a fragmentation in which part of the clump contracts and part of it has to be uh, uh, left up away so that the rest can contract. And for details, please see uh, Griselda Arroyo's uh, Chavez poster. And with that, I am ju I'm just setting up my conclusions. The gravitational collapse generates a flow. It's not an isolated localized event. It's hierarchical because it consists of collapses within collapses. It amplifies an isotropy. So uh, a spheroid, spheroids go to, uh, to sheets and then to filaments and then to hubs and cores and so. And each scale accretes from the parent scale. The accretion fundamentally changes the picture because uh, uh, then an object's lifetime is not determined by its own freefall time, but by the time it takes for the material, uh, for the time it is able to accrete from the larger scale. Filaments are not hydrostatic objects, they are rather flow features, so they're just funneling the material. The clouds and cores masses increase faster than their own stellar mass, and that keeps the apparent star formation efficiency low. Also, the, the freefall time is also decreasing over time because the object is getting denser, and therefore the apparent efficiency per freefall time appears to remain constant, but it's because both the numerator and the denominator are decreasing more or less at the same rate. And this is, uh, this is due to a choking effect of the accretion flow due to the density profile. And the collapse stage during uh, the pre-stellar stage, uh, the pre-stellar stage of the collapse, it's outside in rather than inside out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Enrique. Uh, questions from the audience? Any questions? Oh, if not, I'll have one question to you. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so it's very nice that your simulation is reproducing the low uh, star forming efficiency, but uh, I know that here you've not considered magnetic fields and uh, we know that magnetic fields do actually either decrease the star forming efficiency. So in case if there's an MHT simulation, yeah. uh, the SFE that you're showing from the simulation would further decrease. And so what the simulations might also in another way uh, implies that uh, magnetic fields are not important in your uh, picture. <laughs> Is that true? No, they're not exactly unimportant. I would say they are not the, f the leading order effect, but certainly magnetic fields would slow down the collapse. Uh, that's definitely true. And in fact, so I pointed there that we have efficiencies of several percent. So maybe the magnetic field will give me the, the next uh, order uh, factor of order two or so to decrease it even more. We have magnetic simulation like the first one I showed, uh, we have not performed this same type of measurements there, but we expect them to be even lower. So I would say that ma magnetic fields are not an important, they're just not the leading order effect. Uh, so to leading order, I would go for gravity. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, so we will, uh, mm -hmm. any questions from Slack? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I see. Anyone? Okay, there, mm -hmm. yeah. Enrique, nice talk as usual. <laughs> I just wondered about your idea that the efficiency of star formation remains constant because the accretion onto the cloud mm -hmm. uh, is even more efficient than the collapse of the cloud. Mm -hmm. But uh, that should depend on the collapse time scale, the free fall time. If we say star formation happens on the free fall time mm -hmm. and the cloud becomes more dense, then the free fall time <laughs> in the cloud goes down. Uh, while the accretion onto the cloud might remain constant, M dot might not change because it's a global flow. Mm -hmm. So at some point, I would expect the opposite, you know, because then the cloud will collapse much faster than whatever can be supplied from the outside. So it doesn't it all depend on these details. And so you cannot in general say, that the creation will always be faster than the collapse of the cloud. Uh, what happens, yeah, that, that's a very good question. I, 
what happens is, yeah, it, it's happening more slowly, but on a much larger scale, right? So if you imagine your cloud, it has a larger surface across which it is accreting. So locally, the accretion may not be very fast, but it has a large surface over which to accrete. Locally, the, the, the collapse may be fast, but it involves a small fraction of the mass because it's just the central part. It's just like in, in your 2013 paper with, with Lee as well. So that is happening faster, but on, on smaller amounts of mass. So in the end, we saw that over several million years, the trend continues. The cloud is accreting mass uh, or with, over larger uh, net amounts than the amount of mass it is putting into star, stars per unit sign. Yeah. All right, if there's no other question, let's thank Enrique again. Our next speaker is in person, Andreas Burkett from uh, University of Munich. He's going to talk about uh, collapsing sheets and power of the edge, uh, edge effect. Thanks for the invitation. And I have to say, this is indeed the picture I found on the web. And uh, it's a big mystery to me. So what is he thinking? Uh, uh, what is he staring at? Is he thinking about the collapse of a cloud and fast star formation? Or you know, maybe you don't know what is in front of him. So I was wondering, maybe in the front, let me see how I can do this. Maybe pressing, ah, here. <laughs> maybe there's a glass of whatever Guinness and it was half full or half empty and he didn't know what, what to think about it. Uh, well, okay, this is how it worked with all the time you know we do a lot of science together but we also have a lot of fun together and especially food plays an important role and whenever i visit lee uh, i have a very special treat which i get and this is tuna melt <laughs> this is how he feeds me and i have now had a problem with corona because for almost two years i didn't get any tuna melt because in germany this does not exist so We'll have to get back to this. And he always finds the best tuna melt place in town. So I look forward to this kind of um, treat next time I visit you. And I hope it will be very, very soon. It's very good to see you here at the moment. Now, I would like to actually start with something that has been um, a puzzle for me all the time. And uh, that's related to one of Lee's favorite regions. Uh, basically Taurus, which you all know. And these regions are, this region is exciting because they have several filaments. And in each of the filaments, you see these young stars. And all of these stars have roughly the same age of one to three, three mega years. And that has been Lee's argument. And we heard it very nicely from Tom in the, in the first review section, also where he basically argued that if you have um, an age spread of only one to three mega years, and if all giant molecular clouds show star formation, then the giant molecular clouds can't live longer than three or five mega, mega years. Otherwise, you would see many clouds without star formation, or you would see a larger age spread. But what I do find even more exciting is how you can do it, because Tom discussed it, uh, the sound or turbulent crossing times are much longer. And in each of these filaments, you find the same age. As if somehow star formation in each of these parts was triggered by something so that these parts knew now it's time for me to collapse. And that was something which Lee and I has, have been worrying about for a long time. And the idea we had at that time, it was almost 20 years ago, is that maybe um, there's a coherent process forming this filament by accretion, as Enrique has said. And then at some point, the, and, uh, the filament becomes very strongly gravitationally unstable, begins to collapse, forms stars very quickly, and then disperses. Now, I have to say my view of Taurus has changed recently uh, because of this beautiful image by Andrew Witt. I don't think you can see it very well because of, of the light. But anyway, it, it demonstrates that there are regions in Taurus which have um, a kind of, a, um, how do you say, comet-like shape. I don't know, you, do you see this part here? Here the dot on the one side and the comet-like tail on the right side, look at this region here. We very clearly see a bow shock. 
And that indicates to me that this torus region is completely shaped by a flow which comes from the lower left, which was something Drow Alves was already pointing out. And maybe the same flow that has shaped this kind of filamentary structure might also have triggered star formation. So this connects star formation and molecular cloud formation to much larger scales. And that's what Enrique said, basically, you cannot understand molecular cloud evolution in isolation. You need to put it into the context of the galactic environment. But at that time, we didn't know about this. And so we thought, OK, we take a filament and then see how quickly it condenses into stars. And maybe we get then a filament of stars forming out of this. And uh, just to summarize very quickly the filament physics, if you start with a filament in hydrostatic equilibrium, then in the radial direction, uh, you get the O striker density distribution, which has a certain scale height h. And um, then uh, what is very also important is the criticality, you, criticality of the filament, the mass per length. It should be smaller than the critical value unless the filament uh, would collapse onto itself. And uh, the critical value is something like 16.4 solar mass per parsec. And then if you have these kind of um, conditions, then you will can show easily that below a certain wavelength, any fluctuations are smeared out. And this is the critical wavelength, which is four times the scale height. And there's a dominant wavelength, which is about twice of the critical wavelengths on which fluctuations grow the fastest. And so you would expect the clumps to form with this kind of dominant wavelength if the filament got into some hydrostatic equilibrium before condensing. And that was something we wanted to test at that time. And uh, I hadn't got my tuna melt yet because Lee said, okay, first do the simulation. Um, and I failed miserably. I still got my tuna melt. And now I have a great, great student, actually, he's now a postdoc with me, um, Heigl, who did this um, for me. And he took an infinite filament, let it fragment. He found indeed this kind of dominant wavelength. And he got these kind of strings of, film, of, of fragments forming, just as you see in many of the um, molecular clouds. Now, actually, with this, we could explain very nicely certain fragmentation patterns, like here in, in the L1517 dark cloud, uh, where you get these two fragments. And then you can basically work out the inclination angle. You can work out the line mass before fragmentation. You even can work out the external pressure. Everything of this can be very well explained if you have this kind of string uh, along the filament, uh, fragments along the filament, a uh, simple picture. Now, that was it for the very beginning. But then Lee became nasty. And he said, Andy, you shouldn't do an infinite filament. Uh, the universe is maybe infinitely large, but the filaments, as far as I know, are not infinitely large. So you should actually take a finite filament. And that leads to a problem that is still with me. And I haven't solved it. I'm sorry, 20 years later, I'm still as dumb as I was at that time. Even with a lot of tuna melt, it didn't help much. But maybe with a Guinness, it will help later on. So the reason for this is very simple. If you take a filament, you can easily work out the gravitational forces. And here you see the acceleration vectors. And if there, you see there's acceleration, of course, perpendicular to the filament towards the center, which is compensated or balanced by pressure gradient. But in this direction, you don't have pressure gradient. And you see, actually, in this whole inner region, there's no acceleration at all, because both sides accelerate roughly of the same amount, but there's an enormous amount of acceleration at the edge. We call this the edge effect. So what will happen is that the filament will fall together or will condense or will, will collapse along the edges inwards, and the edges sweep everything up, and you form two dense knots at the very edge, much, much faster than you can form any, flux, any, any clump within the filament. And that is actually when you start the simulation, uh, you get immediately the high density parts at the edge. You get the enormous velocity at the edge. And when at that time I did this filament thing, uh, my code crashed. And I said, Phil, uh, uh, um, Lee, uh, I just get two knots at the edge. And Phil, uh, Lee said, no, that's not good enough, Andy. I could, didn't get a tuna melt that day, I have to say. But anyway, so um, 
I couldn't solve the problem. And so I was looking into lit in basically observations. And here's a pipe. And when you look at the pipe and when you calculate the acceleration vectors, which you can do from the surface density, assuming some symmetry, you indeed find enormous acceleration at the two edges. And at the two edges, you see big star forming regions. There's almost no acceleration in any direction in the inner region. So the pipe might actually show this kind of edge effect to us. But look at this object. This funny thing here, uh, how can I get rid of this up here? I can move it, isn't it? Okay. Well, well. Can I completely remove it? Uh, this is not Taurus because I need to read it because it's so difficult. Uh, 13, okay. you know, so you see now. Okay, so this is this Taurus region has this kind of filament here. And if you look at this carefully, you see four knots. And the four knots are completely symmetric. And there's no edge effect. In fact, this knot is more involved than this knot, and this knot is more, inv more involved than this knot. So it's kind of some symmetry, but it's a completely wrong symmetry with respect to gravity. And the biggest picture or the biggest problem is this. I would have expected a knot there, but there's a hole. How can you generate a hole? I mean, the opposite of a knot in a collapsing filament. So for me, this is an absolute mystery. And Taurus is similar. You form stars all over the place along the filament. They have all the same age and spread, but all the same age, and there's no edge effect. So how can you generate it? And I say, I, I don't know. And let me move this now somewhere else again. I don't know what is there? There's nothing. Okay, let's leave it there. So um, the problem hasn't been solved. And I uh, encourage you to think about it. And uh, let's talk about it, because I think uh, it should be all, everywhere where we have filaments collapsing. Well, so Lee said, OK, Andy, you cannot solve it. Let's do something else. Let's not take a spherical object. Don't take a filament. Let's take a sheet and see what happens when you take a sheet. The sheet is 2D. And do we see the edge effect again? So we took a static circular sheet with a constant surface density and let it gravitation evolve. And indeed, you get again an edge effect. The edge collapses much faster than the inner region. You pile up material at the edge in this kind of sheet. And if you continue let it collapse, then it begins to fragment. Now, along this edge. The fragmentation in this case is completely numerical. And you can see it, you get two fragments here, two fragments here, here, here. This is because of the Cartesian grid, which we assume. But of course, you would get fragmentation in reality too, because the universe is not completely smooth anyway. And you have fluctuations all over. And wherever you would have a fluctuation along this kind of ring, you will get fragments. So basically what you form is a ring of fragments. Um, first, you would form a, a ring of dense gas. Then you it would fragment into a ring of cores, and then it might fragment into a ring of stars. And so the question is, do you actually see this? And we are desperately looking for this. And of course, fortunately, Alvaro Heker is, um, showed me some nice pictures. And there's such a ring here. And I'm not really sure how this ring forms. It could be merging filaments. But maybe in, uh, in this region, we have a flattened structure. And we get exactly this kind of effect working. And I don't really know. It, it, I think these edge effects haven't been studied in any details. And so I don't really know what it's like, uh, what this is like. And indeed, if you look at um, a chameleon, you also see such rings of stars, young stars. And I just wonder how they form. Is this the outcome of such an edge effect where something collapses from the outside in? Or is this a star cluster which is expanding because you got rid of all the gas and now the expansion? disperses the star cluster. So the edge effect might be interesting. And then Lee, I got my tuna melt and then Lee said, okay, Andy, but now you need to become a little more sophisticated. It was all one year, I think it was 2003 at, in, at, at Harvard Smithsonian still. And uh, so it's, and, and he do this. And so we got more general and started with an ellipse, a flattened sheet like ellipse. And we found out there's something new happening. You now get a focal point. There are these two points over there. And you will see again, you have the edge falling in like before, but in these focal points, you get faster accumulation 
than anywhere else. And so the result is that you actually form two objects here. And then the things are condensing here into more objects. And you see them here, 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 and here, and here. And then at the end, we got indeed a filament with lots of clumps. And we were very happy. We were also thinking about writing a nature paper, but then we didn't do it. First of all, because a nature paper is not necessarily the best paper you can write. And the second thing is, um, this is, of course, numerical. And of course, there might be fragments happening, fragmentation happening at the edges. But when the fragments then move towards the center, they don't hit each other. So we have to actually move through the center and move out in this direction. That's what Tom actually said. You, know, you might see fragments having larger random motion perpendicular to the filament than the gas, which gets stuck in the middle. OK, yeah, so I'm almost done anyway. Uh, we then did the one-sided uh, ellipse. And this has, Tom has already shown us um, this, so it's very good. Thanks, Tom, very much for this advertisement. And we, might, we thought we might explain, actually, the integral, uh, fill, um, in, integral Orion cloud. And then we did, um, because I still had a few days um, at Harvard, we did something where we smooth the edges. We, you know, we don't have a sharp edge, but a smooth edge, but this doesn't really change anything. We still get the edge effect happening. And then at the very end, so to say, uh, the crown of everything was we did a completely irregular structure, which is a ghost. We call it a ghost uh, because it looks like ghost. Halloween is coming up anyway. And uh, it's also the, mentioned as a ghost in, in the talk, in, in, in the paper. And then what you see here is all effects happening at the same time. You see the edge effect happening, of course. You see fragment, focal points. You see star cluster forming. And this leads to a highly complex structure at the very end with stars and irregular filaments uh, all over the place. And that we did about 20 years ago. And we haven't followed up. We went to new things. And I'm still not sure whether anything of this is of any relevance in the ISM. First of all, the edge effect doesn't exist in filaments. And it should be everywhere. And I haven't found any paper that explains how you can get rid of it. The turbulent models don't generate edge effects. But why don't they generate edge effects in filaments? I, I'm not, I, I don't know. The other thing is we find all these wonderful structures when you have sheets collapsing. And my question to you is, are there sheets in the ISM? Is a molecular cloud sheet-like? Well, Enrique was actually arguing for that. But it hasn't been shown to me, you know, in the sense that if you, like a, a disk galaxy, you immediately see it. When you look at John, you see it's thin. It's, it's a sheet, yeah, a, a, a flattened structure. But are molecular clouds so flattened that edge effects can play an important role. And I don't know. So I, I look forward to talk to observers or whoever has an idea to figure that out. And at the very end, I just want to mention, Lee, it has always been fascinating to work with you. When you look like this, I know something new is coming up and I have to go to work. And if I'm well done, then I get my tuna melt. So thanks very much for all the uh, interaction we had. Okay, thank you, uh, Andy. We probably have time for just two questions in person versus Lee. Uh, and we have a second question. You're making me hungry. Uh, <laughs> the, the thing that I wonder about, like in Taurus, for instance, uh, first of all, you can see if you look at your, the thing on the right middle, you can see that the gas extends farther to the right than the star. So that's a mm -hmm. flow thing, I think. But, but the other thing I think one has to consider is that you don't just have an, uh, an isolated thing, right? You've got a lot of mass around there and you have to look at the total gravitational potential. And I mm -hmm. suspect that's why the edge effect is more suppressed than like in the pipe. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Great. Hi there, great talk. Um, in the first few slides with Taurus, you use the tadpole shape to motivate having these flows. Um, uh, but then in your latest simulations where you had the irregular collapse, I still kind of saw some tadpole shapes uh, if you go back a couple of slides. Let me go. Um, so I was wondering whether you can distinguish, yeah, like in this one in the top right, um, whether you can distinguish observationally between, yeah, in the bottom this slides, one. there are some tadpoles. Can you distinguish yeah. between tadpoles formed from opposing flows or from the edge effect? 
Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, um, the easiest way to see the importance of the edge effect is to show that this is a flattened structure. Then you would expect something like an edge effect in all cases. So if all of these filaments are in the same plane, uh, that then they could easily have formed through such such an effect. But I don't really know the three D structure of the filaments. You know, they could be all in all directions, and I'm not sure that we have enough resolution to really show the three D. Maybe with Gaia we can now do it, and that would be great to understand. Okay, thank you. We also have a question from Zoom from Marina. If you want to unmute, you can ask your question now. Hi, uh, kind of to piggyback on Lee's comment. So Taurus is kind of a, a collection of four different clouds right now. Two of them are found at different distances and two of them are different spatially. Plus you have a rather extended population uh, that is up to 16 million years old, and it's all it all kind of resembles a collection of source clouds. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, well, first of all, if you have uh, trying to model all of them uh, simultaneously, but also if you try to get some inspirations from the clouds that we have here in our atmosphere, do you think uh, that might be beneficial? Well, the cloud in our atmosphere, you mean here on Earth? Yes, source clouds. Well, the, well, if our, our clouds on Earth are not self-gravitating, first of all, I think. So if gravity plays a role, Enrique would say so, then it's not the same thing. But I agree with you, the turbulence should be, uh, okay, it's, incompre it's, it's it's compressible turbulence here and in the, in, in, the, in the clouds in the sky, it's incompressible turbulence because they are subsonic, isn't it? So that makes a big difference. But I agree with you that the kind of structures, for example, this structure here, is something which I really, uh, which could be kind of a, an instability, a Kelvin Hellman's instability or something like that. And you see some structures down there at the edges, which could very well be because of this flow, you know, going past these clouds and then leading to all kinds of eddies. And I usually, I see this in our, in the sky all the, all the time. And actually I have a, in, in, in a figure uh, for my lecture where I put a cloud, which I, made here in the sky next to to Taurus and it's actually they can't figure out and I can't figure out too if I wouldn't know uh, which one is a cloud in the sky and which one is actually a cloud in the interstellar medium so I would say with respect to some turbulent features we can learn a lot just looking at the sky all right uh, so uh, we will move to the next talk people with in person can chat during the coffee break Okay, let's thank Andreas again for the nice talk and uh, a lot of uh, inspiration for coffee break. <laughs> we have uh, Mike Grudig from affiliated to NASA and uh, Carnegie Observatories. This is going to be presented uh, online. So he's going to talk about star formation and giant molecular clouds, a view from Star Forge. All right, uh, back to you, Mike. All right, you thank you very unmute. much. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, so thank you so much for having me. I'm very happy to share this work that I've been doing with the Starforge collaboration listed here. And uh, if you want to learn more about the project, you can uh, follow the links shown here, uh, visit starforge.space or uh, follow the various archive links I'll have throughout the talk. Uh, now, I've yet to have the pleasure of meeting Lee Hartman uh, but I suspect that we have certain things in common. I think there are some big questions that we both like to think about. So we all know the basic story of star formation. You have some gas, physics happens, and you get some stars. But of course, we want to know the details, right? We want to know what is the life cycle of GMCs and star clusters? What are the time scales uh, that this is happening over? Uh, where does the IMF come from? Why do we get a certain IMF and not something else? Is it universal or does it vary from place to place and how? Uh, how do stars get their mass? Uh, is it all just in some bound clump that's already there and it just kind of shoops it or is it more complicated than that? Uh, why do you get a certain amount of stars for a certain amount of gas? Uh, in other words, why do we have a certain star formation efficiency in a certain region? And how do star clusters form? Uh, and why do we get some that are seemingly bound and not expanding, others that are seemingly unbound and, and expanding? 
Um, and are these part of the same underlying continuum or distinct processes? And really, I think at the heart of a lot of these questions, the question, how does feedback work? Uh, in my opinion, feedback is the elephant in the room uh, that you just kind of have to talk about if you really want to get at some of these key questions about star formation. So if you want to think about star formation, a uh, fun thing to do is do a simulation. And simulations have historically been relegated to kind of two opposite regimes. Uh, on the left, I'm showing various simulations where you follow it, every individual star, uh, but you can only do it in a dense clump or a patch of a GMC uh, that has on the order of maybe a thousand solar masses at best. In the opposite regime, you have global GMC simulations with you know as much as millions of solar masses of gas, so the entire cloud. And you know you can put in various kinds of feedback and, and study how feedback works in that context, but they can't resolve individual stars. And uh, speaking as somebody who's done a lot of the, this type of simulation, I can tell you that if you're relying on a subgrid star formation prescription, to some extent, what you get out of your simulation is basically what you put in, you know, plus hopefully some physics, but we want to do better. So we want a simulation where you can resolve the IMF self-consistently, include all important feedback mechanisms, and scale up to the massive GMCs that are forming most stars. So that's the idea of StarForge. So StarForge is a numerical framework implemented in the Gizmo code uh, for per performing star formation simulations that follow the accretion, formation, and feedback from individual stars. Uh, by essentially marrying all of these different physics together. So we've got MHD, n-body dynamics, uh, radiation, supernovae, stellar winds, jets, and various mechanisms for cooling and chemistry. So I won't get into the gory technical details of how StarForge works. Uh, if you're interested in that, you can follow the archive link on the bottom. Uh, but rather today, I want to talk about one simulation in particular. So this is our first simulation that includes the full physics package uh, in the StarForge framework. So uh, the first numerical simulation with all feedback mechanisms in concert, uh, jets, radiation, winds, and supernovae. Uh, so we just set up a cloud that's 10 parsecs in radius. It's got a total mass of 20,000 solar masses. We give it some initial turbulence and we let it go. Uh, so here's what we get. Uh, in the first couple of mega years, uh, we get this sort of filamentary collapse. Uh, you start to see cores. These cores will start forming stars. And eventually, as these stars accrete more and more, you'll start seeing feedback from those stars uh, as they, they give off jets. Uh, and the feedback will get stronger and stronger as stuff uh, accretes faster and faster. And you can see these sort of parsec scale bipolar outflows now. Uh, and as we get into a more advanced state of collapse, we're going to start getting more massive stars. Uh, and you can see if you look closely, uh, some stars have started blowing bubbles now uh, due to their combined radiation and winds. And as this is all happening, the stars are actually kind of assembling into a dense star cluster from a hierarchically clustered configuration. And uh, as this is happening, the feedback is actually getting really concentrated and it kind of initiates the the terminal phase of the GMC evolution where uh, it starts to really blow apart due to feedback. Uh, so we've started to open up a cavity in the GMC now, uh, and the cluster is dispersing because it's never had a chance to virialize. And uh, just then the first supernova went off uh, from a 31 solar mass progenitor. And uh, essentially when that supernova goes off, you know, any hope that that cloud had of staying together uh, is gone. It was the final nail in the coffin. Uh, so, so let's sort of break down what's going on in terms of feedback in this simulation. Uh, so first we can look at the accretion luminosity of the stars, and this to some extent just traces the star formation history of the cloud. Uh, so it rises rapidly, uh, it reaches a, a sort of peak, and then it kind of peters out uh, thereafter. Um, but what happens is that uh, the fusion powered luminosity, in other words, just the regular starlight, uh, dwarfs the accretion luminosity as soon as you get any kind of appreciable massive star formation uh, about one free fall time in. So if you look at the total uh, radiative luminosity, then it's dominated by the fusion powered luminosity for most of the cloud uh, lifetime. 
Uh, and we can compare this to the momentum injection rate from stellar winds uh, in units of uh, solar luminosity over C. Uh, and we see that it, it actually gets close to being comparable to the just raw momentum present in the starlight uh, when uh, later on when you start getting stars going wolf ray A, but it never quite gets there. Uh, but if we look at the momentum injection rate from jets, uh, it can actually be substantial. The momentum injection from jets actually dominates over all other feedback mechanisms uh, through an appreciable fraction of the lifetime of the cloud, actually, uh, basically all the way up until this point where you start getting this uh, net global outflow uh, that starts to blow the cloud apart. Uh, so jets can be very important on GMC scales, uh, which hasn't been so much appreciated thus far, uh, just because people haven't been doing uh, jet simulations on these sorts of scales very much. Uh, and lastly, it's not an apples to apples thing, but uh, we can look at the increase in the ionizing photon production rate, uh, which is basically punctuated by the formation of very hot, massive stars. And uh, the ionizing radiation can have a substantial effect upon feedback by just simply unbinding gas or creating pressure-driven uh, H2 regions that drive bubble flows. And lastly, uh, toward the end, we do get one supernova from a 31 solar mass progenitor. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, although the cloud is already disrupting by the time the supernova goes off, uh, the supernova really seals the deal. Uh, it boosts the velocity of dispersion of the cloud as a whole by about a factor of two from 10 to about 20 kilometers per second. And uh, we can play this game of comparing the momentum injection rate to the weight of the cloud, gm squared over r squared. Again, just put in units of solar luminosity over c. And what's kind of interesting is that whether you care about jets or radiation or winds, uh, all of these feedback mechanisms have momentum injection rates comparable to the weight of the cloud, which means that all of these mechanisms are potentially dynamically relevant. So you really want to get the whole picture of feedback. You want to do a holistic approach and you want to disentangle what feedback mechanism does what. Uh, so we can take a look at star formation efficiency versus time, just the fraction of gas mass converted to stars. Uh, and uh, you see that it rises rapidly in the beginning, then it kind of levels off to a final stellar mass uh, at about 8%. Now you can never measure this directly because you'd have to be there at both the beginning and the end of star formation, uh, but you can infer it indirectly. Uh, and we do end up uh, within the sort of one sigma range uh, reported by uh, Chiffon's 2020, uh, doing this with statistical modeling in nearby galaxies. Uh, you can also do a mock observation modeling what you would see if you tried to measure this just by taking the ratio of free free luminosity to CO luminosity, uh, as was done in Lee 2016. Uh, and we see that, uh, you know, we do sort of span similar values to the true efficiency, but it's obviously behaving differently where it underestimates the efficiency at early times and overestimates it at late times. Uh, and we all can also do this kind of mock observation uh, mimicking YSO counts, uh, comparing to Evans uh, 2014 and Pockrell 2020. Uh, and again, uh, it definitely does uh, get close to the true uh, efficiency at, at points, but you have the sort of opposite bias where you're overestimating at early times and you're underestimating at late times. And it's a similar story for the periphery fall star for information efficiency, which is very dynamic, I should mention, uh, never really approaches anything resembling a steady state. It rises rapidly, uh, it reaches a, a, a peak, and then it sort of peters out exponentially. Uh, now, if we try and mock observe this, again, just using free free emission over CO emission, uh, we again have the same sort of bias where we're underestimating and then we're overestimating. Uh, if we do the YSO counting type measurement, then uh, uh, it also doesn't quite uh, reflect the true variation in the periphery fall star formation efficiency. Uh, it's sort of compressing this, this wide range into uh, a somewhat narrower range of uh, efficiencies you'd actually observe, uh, which could potentially be an explanation 
uh, that could reconcile these dynamic star formation models with the small scatter that people find when they go out and do these sorts of measurements. Uh, so we can talk about the IMF, which has been a long and winding road. Uh, first of all, uh, with just isothermal gas and magnetic fields and gravity, here's what you get. It's a disaster. Everything's way too massive. Um, so, okay, uh, maybe the gas is not isothermal and we have to do realistic cooling. Then this is what you get. Uh, okay, so maybe feedback is important. So we switch on jets and Finally, we're getting something that kind of looks like your you know, favorite canonical form of the IMF here. Uh, but the problem is that we have this high mass excess where it kind of shallows out toward high masses. Um, because essentially with the jets, what we find is that uh, even if we include jet feedback, the most massive stars can still just accrete forever if they want to, nothing's really stopping them. Uh, so finally, we do the full physics package and we get something much more reasonable. So uh, we address this high mass excess to a certain extent, extent uh, limiting the maximum stellar mass. Uh, it used to be 500, now it's about 50. Uh, and, and we get something that uh, looks reasonably like, like a, a canonical IMF form uh, in the sort of low to intermediate mass regime too. Uh, it's not perfect. Like if you run, uh, you know, three piece power law fit on it, you get a slope of minus 2.1. You get a turnover mass of uh, 1.5. So, you know, I'm not going to be that guy who says, you know, look who, look how great our IMF is. We have all the answers. Uh, you know, what we're really trying to do here is just figure out how this IMF responds to different physics. And what we can really say here is that the IMF is very sensitive to feedback physics. So I want to finish by addressing a sort of question I've taken a great interest in lately, and uh, a lot of people have taken interest in over the years, which is where do stars get their mass from in time and space? You have different pictures. So you can get your mass from a bound core that's already there when the protostar forms and it just kind of sucks it up. Uh, you can have a sort of bondy hoil or competitive accretion type scenario. Uh, where stars form as uh, low mass seeds and you have these small differences in their masses that get amplified uh, as they creep from a common reservoir. Uh, and more recently, you've had this interesting picture uh, from, for example, Padawan 2020, uh, the inertial inflow picture, uh, where the accretion rate is set by the inflow rate of turbulent eddies and Massive stars are essentially just the lucky ducks that had happened to be at the center of the turbulent eddy and receive all this infall material. So first of all, we can ask how long do stars of different masses take to get their mass in the simulation? So this is the time it takes to get 95% of your mass. And uh, what we find is that it's kind of all over the place. Uh, if we compare our mean value with the value inferred from Offner and McKee 2011 from the protostellar luminosity function, uh, we get a similar value about 300 kilo years, but clearly there's this trend with mass uh, where more massive stars are taking longer to assemble. Uh, and you kind of have this upper envelope, which is basically just the turbulence crossing time of the cloud. So that kind of makes sense. Uh, but we're seeing accretion rates that are much greater than uh, what you would predict from the inertial inflow model. Uh, so that doesn't seem to fully describe what we're seeing here. Uh, breaking down further what's going on with the accretion rates, uh, we see that there is a monotonic, uh, decently tight trend in the accretion rate with the current stellar mass that a star has. Uh, moreover, if we break this down by the final stellar mass that the star has, we see that the mass of stars as babies are not accreting that much faster than, than the stars that, that won't get massive. Uh, and we can have these sort of two different regimes where uh, it's kind of a M squared like scaling uh, and maybe it's kind of leveling off toward low masses. So obviously these evoke sort of bondy Hoyle like and uh, isothermal collapse like pictures. Uh, okay. Finally, we can look at uh, the size of the gas reservoir that a star gets its mass from. And uh, we find that the most massive stars draw their mass from one to 10 parsec scales, broadly speaking, maybe 0. 0.5 to five. Uh, moreover, uh, the more massive stars uh, draw increasingly lower fractions of their mass uh, from the initial bound core that they form out of. 
whereas low mass stars uh, get all of their mass from that core. Uh, and we can also look at this as a function of the time it takes to gather that mass. Uh, and we get this upper, upper envelope, which is basically just the causal horizon for the turbulence. Uh, that's not surprising. Uh, but we get something that actually agrees kind of well with what you'd expect if uh, you're just accreting on a time scale set by the size line width relation uh, for the size of the eddy that you're in. So there might be something turbulence like going on there. Uh, and lastly, we can just look at what the relation is between the eventual mass of the star uh, and the mass of the core that it formed in the gravitationally bound core. And there almost isn't one, it's really all over the place. So the initial core mass is not a great predictor of the final mass. Uh, and that's a problem for certain star formation scenarios. So to break it down, uh, we can compare what we find in Starforge with different theories. So in Starforge, mass does come from uh, the bound core, but also a bondi hoyle like mode uh, with uh, something pos some possible signatures of turbulent eddies. Uh, Massive stars get their mass from scales of one to 10 parsecs um, over a time scale of 0.3 to three mega years. Uh, we find a strong dependence of the accretion rate on the current mass of the star uh, and possibly other things we have to look for it. And we find that the core mass does not predict the final mass. And you'll notice that uh, this doesn't agree perfectly with any one of these three pictures. Uh, so it might be a new picture uh, uh, so we have to look at these simulations and really see what's going on. So to summarize, uh, Starforge is capable of doing simulations of massive GMCs that predict the IMF self consistently with all feedback in concert. Uh, we found that star formation accelerates until feedback disrupts the cloud uh, for final star formation efficiency on the order of 10% uh, or so. Uh, all the different feedback mechanisms are potentially important. So we've got our work cut out for us trying to just disentangle what everything is doing. Uh, feedback regulates the star formation efficiency uh, more or less to observed levels. Uh, moreover, the ob observational tracers for star formation efficiency have different biases. So hopefully we can use the simulations as an interpretive tool. Uh, feedback affects the IMF drastically. Jets are regulating the low mass star formation and the IMF turnover. Uh, and other feedback mechanisms clearly have something to do with regulating the high masses. Uh, so watch the archive for our sort of IMF omnibus paper by uh, David Senov, which should be coming out in the next couple months. And lastly, the qualitative star formation picture seems to combine various aspects of various proposed uh, pictures that have come before. Uh, massive star formation can take a long time, as long as three mega years, and it gathers gas from large scales. Uh, the core mass function doesn't map onto the IMF in a simple way, uh, and accretion accelerates steeply as you get to higher stellar masses. And uh, with that, I'll wrap up and take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. I, I don't think the inertial flow thing makes, makes any sense because uh, you, you've got gravity, and if you look at uh, gravitational simulations, you get streams coming in. And you don't have to say, well, it's a, it's a, it's an accident that, that you make you make the thing, you know, where they're coming together because that's that's where gravity pulls it in, and I think that if you do that, the earlier uh, things by Ian Bonnell and so on, emphasize the tidal limitation, uh, of of the competitive accretion, but I think that's not really relevant in most cases because th they assumed a static, overall gravitational potential. Uh, to do the tidal limitation, and in many cases you just don't see that, and it's not really tidally limited. So I would say that a lot of your results are are really uh, consistent with something akin to bondi hoyle accretion. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I think that's a good point. Slack. Yep. So the first question that we have on Slack, and there's a few others. So if you don't mind answering them later on, that would be great. Mike, um, is from York Bink. If you don't mind unmuting, you can ask your question now. Oh, he's here. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was actually more of a comment, but um, a 30 solar mass star is not very likely to make a supernova, I don't think. Um, both theoretically, it's unlikely. Um, 
and, and observation, we only know supernova up to about 20 solar masses. So this particular 30 solar mass star, I, I don't think will make a supernova. Yeah, that's fair. We're using a fairly crude uh, model where just anything more massive than eight uh, goes supernova at the end of its lifetime. Uh, and yeah, I know there's been a lot of work since then uh, that has been sort of elucidating uh, that picture. Uh, so, you know, that, that'll that that'll be incorporated in sort of the next round of fancy stellar evolution modules. Thanks. All right, thank you, Mike. And uh, let's thank again all the speakers of the morning session. So, Thanks, everyone. Uh, hope everyone is back from the coffee break. We are going to have next the invited speaker, who's Fabian Heitz from University of North Carolina. And he's going to talk about cloud formation and super shells, insight from simulations. So Fabian is uh, going to have 30 plus five minutes. It's back to you, Fabian. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and um, I, when, when I was asked, when I was invited, I, um, um, I was hoping to talk about cloud formation supershells inside some simulations, and I will towards the end, but it turns out that uh, we weren't quite at the level that I feel comfortable uh, presenting um, all the results uh, for technical reasons, uh, some of my own doing, some outside of my control. And then as um, Tom already pointed out um, this morning, um, I realized, yeah, there is a anniversary this year, namely 20 years of Hartmann Ballesteros Paredes and Burry. And so I thought I'd go back to that paper and I like to call this paper um, by another name, namely Occam's Razor in Action. And Occam's Razor, of course, is um, just other things being equal. The demonstration which derives from fewer postulates should be superior. Let's see, I think the Aristotelian version of that uh, principle that has been around for a long time. And I wanted to use the paper a little bit to highlight um, the various assumptions that are made in uh, possibly competing style forming formation uh, theories. So you know, of course, the, um, the classical picture or the classical argument that star formation must be slow, um, just given the molecular mass in the galaxy, uh, divided by the free fall time, and then comparing that to the actual observed star formation rate. That's sort of the standard conundrum that we all learn. And um, that has clearly led to the idea that star formation is a slow process. Namely, yeah, we have to slow down the star formation. And if you want to make something slow that is um, gravitationally unstable, you want to support it. You know? So that is, the, that is the thinking. So either you use magnetic fields and or supersonic turbulence. And this leads to some uh, predictions, namely that, for example, you should have some clouds that do not form stars. And we'll see that in a moment. Um, the alternative is that star formation is rapid, inefficient. And um, as Hartmann, Ballesteros, Perez, and Bergen, HBB01, um, um, suggested, um, that clouds form in large scale flows, stars form upon cloud formation, and clouds disperse once stars forms. And we just saw uh, very impressive simulations actually um, suggesting that whole cycle from beginning to end. The poster child for the slow star formation case was for a long time the Madeleine Fadeus cloud, um, I think two million solar masses worth of gas. And um, there is a quiescent core in here, here a version from the GEF in 2009. And then Tom looked at the cloud a little bit um, more in detail 
and found, I think, 40 plus uh, embedded objects in that dense core. And so it turned out if you increase the resolution, if you increase especially the sensitivity and go to longer wavelengths, um, you actually find embedded objects. And so, of course, also going to higher density means you're going to shorter time scales. You're probing shorter and shorter free fall times. So not only was the higher density and resolution uh, an issue in terms of uh, um, like tracking deeper, and deep, more deeply embedded objects, but also shorter time scales. And this has been a theme uh, since the mid 80s, essentially, um, when people first realized that actually a large fraction of the clouds are forming stars, um, that the more you, so the more sensitive you get, the higher the resolution, more and more of the clouds form stars. So, so that is one, yeah, pro, is, yeah one uh, comment, so to speak, on this low star formation. Um, what uh, HBB01 went after um, was, um, as Tom already discussed, um, mainly uh, to a large extent, the stellar ages and specifically the age spread. Um, here, a version from Hartman in 2003. Um, and most of the stars form within essentially three or so mega years, depending on how you bin this. Um, the question of how to bin this is actually a very important question because um, for a long time, people tried to bin this look or did bin this logarithmically. So the histogram of the ages. Um, and if you bin this logarithmically, of course, um, this looks more like something like that. And that means that you get um, like an age spread that looks like 10 mega years, even though Event. It's just a few mega years. And the other real realization of the other point um, um, HBB pointed out was that if you look at um, the young stars um, up to three mega years, there's a molecular gas associated with them. Once they get older, the gas is dispersed. And by now, that is uh, like. Um, um, like standard information, so to speak. Yeah. Now, regarding the postulates, so we have here one thing's being equal, other things being equal, the demonstration, et cetera, et cetera. So let's look at the postulates for a moment. So first, for the slow star formation, if, there's, if the clouds are supported by turbulence, the assumption is indeed that the clouds in are some kind of equilibrium, no okay have to be supported. And specifically, um, um, the key and collaborators and, um, and Krumholtz, Tan, and so on, um, argued that the clouds are actually in very equilibrium. And it's interesting that McKee himself pointed out in 92, I think, that this, of course, doesn't apply to a single cloud, but it applies to a cloud either averaged over time or if you average over an ensemble of clouds. So it's actually something slightly different, yeah, um, than a statement about an individual cloud. Um, Ballesteros Paredes, Javier, showed uh, in 2006 that um, in his paper, uh, Six Myths uh, about the Beer Theorem, um, that um, for an individual cloud, it's pretty much impossible under realistic conditions because of the structure, because of the surface terms, they spelled out the assumptions behind the very analysis. You need to take account surface terms. Um, if you have external potentials, Javier in 2009, you can actually um, have the gravity be both contracting and disrupting. And so there are many more details here. Né? And Andy earlier showed, um, what happens if um, you have really non-standard, meaning non-spherical clouds, um, what gravity can actually generate them. And of course, if you have something in some sort of a pressure, turbulent pressure equilibrium, you would expect a spheroidal cloud shape or spherical cloud shape actually. And the clouds are filamentary, 
has been known now for a long time. Um, so if you want to support something by turbulence with a, a, a filamentary structure by turbulence, you would need a very specific velocity field, essentially. Yeah? So the second um, point is the turbulence for the um, to support the cloud must be driven. And this goes back to um, the late 90s, um, Mordecai Mark McLow and Ostracker Gamby Stone and uh, Pater Nordlund. They showed that uh, supersonic turbulence, whether it's hydrodynamics or uh, magnetohydrodynamics, uh, decays within a dynamical time. Dynamical time is essentially the crossing time, the, um, the eddy turn over time. And if you look at a derivation of a Kolmogorov cascade, um, that would be uh, consistent with such an argument. Um, and so if you want to support the cloud for longer or much longer than a freefall time, like 10 freefall times, like support, uh, uh, suggested or assumed in the slow star formation picture, um, then you would have to drive the turbulence. The driver actually needs to be within the cloud because it's, you cannot inject the energy from the outside. That has been tried um, by Alphane Ways, Emma Green, for example, I think in 2000, 1998. Um, and of course, if you drive something that you want to support against gravity from the outside, what you're actually doing is you're generating an energy flow, an energy flux. And that energy flux, you need more energy outside than inside. The energy flux essentially starts to compress the cloud instead of supporting it. Or you could see it another way. Um, if you take the mass flux, rho u, um, and the mass is conserved, which is, I guess, a good assumption. Um, since the cloud density is higher, that means that the velocity in the cloud must be lower and then the environmental velocity. That means that the square of the velocity is much lower than in the environment. And if you then translate that to the momentum flux, which is actually a kinetic energy density, then that uh, kinetic energy density inside the cloud must be lower than outside, must be, would be lower than outside. But of course, you want it to have the other way around. You want support. Mm -hmm. mm. Third, the turbulence must be some sort of a micro turbulence. No? So it's all the assumptions here. And um, that is also given the, um, the um, information about the scale distribution of turbulence. Uh, it's not consistent with what is observed. Here, an example by Brunt. I know this is velocity, um, but we just saw that the energy also, um, so inside the cloud, it must be larger. So on smaller sc scales, it will be larger than uh, on larger scales. And that is inconsistent, what we know about also turbulent cascades. Um, so, and fourth, the turbulence must be solenoidal. So meaning of, mostly solenoidal. Um, that is a discussion right now. Um, there's a paper by Orcus et al. Um, about solenoidal turbulence in Orion. And this is very hard to tease out from the data. And then they argue that there is some evidence for solenoidal turbulence. And they try to relate that to the star formation activity across Orion. And now, of course, I, I'm not, uh, you, you already know this. This is not a philosophically or logically exact. Uh, I'm just throwing out these points and I'm actually now switching to another scenario. So uh, it's, you might think, well, what is he doing there? Um, but um, I sort of put the magnetically supported picture and the magnetic support picture and the turbulence support picture into one group, essentially all slow star formation. And so that's why we have the switch here to uh, 
a magnetically supported cloud formation or star formation. Um, and in that case, of course, the cloud globally must be subcritical. And um, that raises uh, two issues. First, it raises an issue of boundary conditions um, in two, two ways, actually. First, um, you need uh, to contain the cloud with a not observed or an, an external pressure that is at a level that's not observed. Um, because you have the magnetic pressure in the center supporting the cloud. And so essentially you would have to continue that into the environment. And so that's an issue. The other issue is that um, of course you can have, con you continue to have accretion. So actually the cloud would accrete material and not just sit in isolation. And what this all points out or what this all boils down to is that this is always a question about boundaries. Yeah? So what boundaries are you assuming? Can you actually assume that the clouds are in isolation? And we just saw in several talks that we cannot. So we have to look actually at the whole system. And that is one of the main points in um, HBB01. Yeah? So I have to look at the whole system. Um, and yeah, here's um, another way to see this. Uh, this is a pressure density plot. The color lines are thermal equilibrium curves from Koyama and Natsuka. It's a plot adapted from Hakar et al. in 2022. So protostars and planets chapter. And the midplane pressure is uh, here in a dashed line indicated, uh, drawn from Cox 2005. And um, so over plotting here, I'm just grouping this here, essentially anything that's pink are molecular fibers, blue are molecular filaments, so giant molecular clouds um, as we know them, as, as which we know them, and the orange is H1 filaments. And I mean, anything above the midplane pressure, um, there's, there's pretty much nothing else that can generate these internal pressures except gravity. I mean, it's 10 to the eight or 10 to the seven or something like that. Um, the exception of course is the H1 filaments, which are below the, the uh, mid-plane pressure. Um, and so if they hadn't an additional pressure component, they would be squeezed. And so of course, um, based on the work by Susan Clark and others, we know that uh, these are act these are actually magnetically dominated, the H1 filaments. Yeah, so there is um, magnetic influence. Um, so let's switch over to the other uh, scenario, um, the um, rapid star formation scenario. There are two postulates. And you might think, well, actually there are five. Uh, he just numbered them one and two, and then he has some other um, um, points here. I would argue that the bullet points here are actually um, consequences of the scenario or consequences of the first item and not, not a uh, postulate. So the postulate is, Clouds are swept by, up by a large scale flow that gives you the coordination across uh, a structure that uh, has a crossing time, has, has an H spread that is smaller than the crossing time. Yeah. Um, it, um, it turns out if you start in the atomic phase, once you uh, reach the column density for shielding, the gas becomes self-gravitating. Coincidentally, so that means that once you have molecular gas, you form stars. So once you have a molecular cloud, you form stars, rapid onset of star formation. And it also, uh, that same column or similar concept, column density is the column density for supercriticality, meaning once the cloud gets gravitationally unstable. Mm, the nice, or oh, one of the nice side effects of the flow driven cloud formation picture or the rapid star formation picture is that you get free supersonic turbulence. And this has been pointed out by many people. Mm, and uh, 
So we don't have to drive the turbulence in the flow driven cloud formation picture. It's a consequence of the cloud formation. It's actually inevitable. We cannot get around it. Um, and one of the reasons is, this is a little, a little opaque, I apologize. Um, the first one is just the momentum uh, equation, so momentum conservation. The second one, the second equation is the first equation taking the curl. So we're looking at the uh, evolution of the vorticity. And there's a term, nope, there's a term in the back here. The last term is something that isothermal cloud and from cloud simulations would not have, or any barotropic uh, equation of state simulation would not have, namely, if the gradient of the density and the gradient of the pressure are not aligned, that drives vorticity. And um, so there are many, many sources for turbulence apart from just Kevin Hamels and Rayleigh Taylor and stuff like that, or non-linear distance shell and stuff like and then there's a whole discussion about how we measure this. Tom pointed this out. We've heard about this, I'll skip that. Um, the major attraction or a major attraction as Lee in a paper wrote um, of the notion of a flow driven cloud formation is that uh, we see uh, several examples of it in the solar neighborhood. And I want to take that opportunity to um, mention some other quotable, not notable quotes, quotable notes. Uh, Namely, to make stars, you need gravity. Uh, with a, I didn't do this right. To make stars, you need gravity. So now I did it. Um, once there was a question, how do the stars within a cloud coordinate their formation? No, cross a time larger than the age spread. Please answer, they don't. Um, I'm going to put back the star into star formation. And my favorite is the Bonner Ebert rectangle. And if you don't know what the Bonner Ebert rectangle is, I really recommend uh, Lee's book that, um, that Tom already pointed out. So, what do we see in the solar neighborhood? Here is a recent paper by Biali um, about um, the Perseus Taurus shell, where they reconstruct essentially the gas structure. Uh, around uh, or containing Perseus and Taurus. And if you ever wondered uh, what connects Perseus and Taurus, it seems to be actually an expanding shell, an old shell at that. And so that's a thing they point out. Um, but um, so it might actually be that um, Taurus and Perseus are just the consequences of an uh, expanding shell. And, Andy pointed out the windswept morphology of Taurus. That might be also a case or more so the thing. Um, usually it's not always just one mechanism, but so here's evidence, uh, evidence by Gaskowski um, at alpha lupus one um, squeezed between two um, uh, X-ray bubbles essentially. And um, then a solar neighborhood, yeah, I take this with a grain of salt here. Um, here we go into the LMC, the advantages, of course, in the LMC, we, we see this face on. And so we have a better view of, um, um, we can see the shells better, we see it from the outside. Um, so two super shells and in between a ridge of molecular and uh, neutral gas. And then all the work by Dawson and collaborators. Um, Dawson did a systematic then investigation of uh, LMC supershells and tried to quantify the effect of uh, cloud formation of shells on supershells on cloud formation. And it is present according to them, but it's sort of a 10% effect, um, at least with the statistics they have. Um, and of course, I sort of skipped over this. Um, there are other works, other, um, other um, yeah, precursors. I want to point out Ballesteros, uh, Paredes, uh, Hartmann, and Vasquez Semadini in 99, which is actually the companion paper to HBB01, if you will. And so there um, they pointed out that if you if you want to form clouds, you need an inflow, and that's just a continuity equation. And that's a paper where the term tips of the iceberg was coined for molecular cloud formation. 
let me switch to um, the uh, um, local and global model, something uh, I should say, shell models. So um, there's a very neat, um, or there are several neat sketches in uh, HBB01. One was uh, Tom already showed, here's another one, uh, namely like the scenario that uh, Lee imagined for um, flow-driven cloud formation. Um, this sometimes uh, or has been or has been referred to as collect and collapse and wing Lara and so on. Uh, McRae and Kafatos uh, studied this in detail. So the shell expansion, the sweep up, the condensation of material. And of course, there are modern studies, numerical studies, um, plenty of them. An um, example here is by Zamora Avila. So it's not a super shell, it's an H2 region, but still uh, feedback and sweep up. Um, and um, the Zamora Aviles paper points out or suggests something that Lee um, pointed out that because the background medium is already structured, um, you wouldn't always expect a wonderful spherical shell to form. You would expect uh, clouds to form on one side and maybe not on the other. Or if you have two shells, of course, you squeeze the material as we just saw in the work by Dawson and by Gaskowski. Yeah. Um, so the shell, the cloud formation in shells is sort of an interesting, yeah, so it's an interesting laboratory, if you will. Um, you can study this in global simulations like uh, the silk models by um, um, Stephanie Beis and collaborators, so Seyfried et al, for example, 2017. Um, and if you look at, so then you have essentially the whole, um, the whole um, um, environment. And you also can um, see that, um, um, you also can think about it in terms of like an uh, yeah, um, isolated model. Um, then you can study essentially the evolution of a shell by itself. Um, and that is something that Ferrier in 91 did um, analytically or semi-analytically. So they were interested in the effect of magnetic fields on the shell expansion. And there are some interesting effects because essentially what happens is the material is being shunted down to the um, equatorial uh, regions. So into the thick part here, because essentially of like a, if, if you scrape something up from with a, with a spatula or something like that. No? So you have the magnetic feed lines and the expanding shells and you uh, scrape it up. Um, so what we tried to do is, um, uh, we started some um, very idealized models, a turbulent background with a shell expanding. So that is at the end of the simulation. And I made the mist, I realized I turned this into a PDF. Uh, so that it actually is guaranteed to work. And that of course means that I don't have my movies anymore or my animations, that's okay. Um, and so you see the uh, extinction, you see the average temperature, uh, centroid velocity, and you can see essentially a cloud forming here that moves towards your observer. And if you look at the cloud in density and velo inflow velocity, so that's the projected velocity radially towards the center of mass, you see these filament inflows um, that have been now observed um, and also reproduced in many simulations. Can play around with uh, comparing models with shells at the bottom and no shells. So these are time evolutions of the freefall time and the gene length. So the gene length is and the freefall time on the y axis and then against the time. And so with a shell, you get the collapse earlier. And um, so it actually enhances the star formation. And it turns out also what you need, you would need um, a machinery to actually follow the flow pattern over many orders of magnitude. And so we started playing around with expanding grids. Um, and so this is just very preliminary. Uh, we can see that we can actually cover the three phases from free expansion, set of Taylor to snowplow phase. So including 
Claudia de Flores. You have two minutes. Thank you. And the goal would be to um, to um, yeah figure out how that meshes with uh, Lee's picture of uh, flow, yeah, sweep up um, along magnetic field lines, what the roles of the field plays. And with that, um, I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lee. Great, thank you, Fabian. Uh, let's see if we have any questions from the audience here in person. Okay, we have a question from Enrique. Hi, Fabian. Uh, good to see you. And uh, thanks for this uh, great review slash uh, invited talk. Uh, just one comment. I, I totally do agree with the with the idea of the collect and collapse. But perhaps when you think on the, on the galactic scale, uh, my impression is that the main, the dominant collecting mechanism rather than super shells could be the spiral alarm sweeping itself. Uh, so uh, I, I would argue, uh, and I would like your opinion, uh, that that might be the, the first order collecting mechanism in, at, on the galactic scale. Yeah, I wouldn't argue with that point in grand design spirals. Um, the point has been made, I think, uh, by Claire Dobbs that in fluxion galaxies, um, this may not work that well. Um, but for grand design spirals, I, I totally agree. So then, then you get into the models by um, uh, Eve Ostreicher and collaborators um, um, about sweep up and, and spiral arms and what role that plays. Uh, yeah, no, that's totally right. Uh, let's thank Fabian again for the nice review on super shells. We'll move on to our next contributed uh, talk. So that's going to be by Jan Forbick from University of Hertfordshire. So Jan is going to talk about the Beyond the Milky Way Resolved Dust and Continuum and see observations in uh, giant molecular clouds in Andromeda Galaxy. Oh, okay. Yeah, thanks first of all for giving me this uh, this opportunity and uh, thanks also to the LOC. It's This is my first hybrid meeting uh, of this scale. And so this, there's all this extra work uh, for the LOC. This has uh, been uh, a very good run so far already, so thanks a lot. I, I will talk about um, observations of molecular clouds uh, in uh, nearby galaxies, in particular in the Andromeda galaxy, and I would like to, to show some new observational uh, opportunities that we have in the form of uh, wideband receiver upgrades. Uh, this talk uh, is, uh, of course, partly inspired also by Lee's previous work. My own interests range from uh, uh, individual YSOs to molecular clouds to, to clouds in nearby galaxies. And uh, as an undergraduate, I already worked uh, with uh, Lee's book, that, which has been mentioned a couple of times now. And I also use it with my own students still. Um, when I now was looking for some context with nearby galaxies, I, I started to Google a bit to see uh, what I could find. And then I realized that I had never really paid uh, attention to the cover image of Lee's book, which is undoubtedly showing a galaxy. Uh, I, I couldn't quite uh, find uh, the context for this and, uh, before I then realized that there's actually, uh, apparently at Cambridge, uh, there's one uh, astronomy cover image per decade. And, and so this is used for all kinds of different contexts. So there's, uh, if you haven't seen it yet, there's a galaxy on the cover of this book. Uh, this talk is structured into seven individual small pieces and or thesis, one could almost say. Uh, the idea really is that we can now observe molecular clouds in M31 in a way that is uh, has a, a, a decent parameter overlap with uh, studies of uh, local clouds. And so we can uh, actually uh, expand our uh, local sample of clouds in a, in a nearby galaxy. And the key really is that uh, uh, what this is based on is the first resolved dust observations of GMCs in an external disk galaxy. Uh, so let me start with the, the, the first point here. Uh, star, uh, star formation studies um, are, have a ground truth, which is defined by dust observations. Uh, we've already seen a little bit of this and Tom gave this, this great overview uh, this morning already. 
Um, what do I mean by, by dust observations? There are two uh, types of observations that are relevant here, um, both shown on this slide. One is uh, extinction mapping. This is uh, Joao's famous uh, example of B68 on the left-hand side here, uh, uh, which is seen as a dark cloud in the optical and then becomes transparent in the near infrared. And there's actually another starless core here in the, in the, in the pipe nebula where we compared a high resolution extinction map with dust emission. So there, there are two different types of observations that we can use to constrain dust. Very briefly, how does this work? Uh, for extinction, we can get uh, precise and accurate measurements toward individual lines of sight. Uh, so th this really depends on having a, an appropriate background. Then it works exceedingly well, uh, and it gives us uh, essentially direct constraints on the optical depth. Uh, the dust emission measurement is very complementary. It's best where there's most dust, right? so high density regions. Uh, so it's uh, that's that's really directly complementary to extinction measurements. Um, it's, however, more difficult to get high resolution measurements um, on uh, in, in larger regions. And there's an additional difficulty. There's a degeneracy between the temperature and the tau because what we observe is essentially the Planck function of an effective dust temperature times the optical depth. But that's still uh, um, a limited set of, of parameters uh, to keep in mind. Um, starting out from the most nearby clouds, uh, we had uh, this is a, a, a wide field optical image of a part of the, the galactic plane, two famous galactic uh, molecules. You can directly see why extinction mapping is so powerful because this is basically giving us the highest resolution information of the shapes of these clouds and the structure. And even in these most nearby clouds, there are major differences in uh, the star formation rate. So for example, the, the mass of uh, the pipe nebula and uh, of Europe's only differ by about a factor of two, but the star formation rate differs by a factor of 15. So evidently, even in, the, in this small sample of the most nearby clouds, uh, there's already more going on. Uh, very briefly, part of the motivation for this project is uh, encapsulated in this plot, uh, which is showing star formation rate versus cloud mass, because if we take the galactic clouds, uh, the, the couple of clouds where we can do um, exquisite extinction mapping and YSO counting for the star formation rate, uh, and so we have some information on, on the, the structure, the density structure on these clouds, we can plot the star formation rate against the dense gas mass uh, by column density or the total gas mass. So every cloud is, is shown twice. Uh, there's a direct relation between uh, the, the dense gas and uh, the star formation rate. There's some similarity here to earlier work by Gao and Salomon for entire galaxies where one needs to use molecular traces, in this case, CO and HCN. And so what, what this is, is telling us is that there's a, a correlation between the star formation rate and the dense gas fraction of the cloud, which is an apparent contradiction to the Kennecke-Schmidt relation, which is why this has uh, started a, a, a very interesting debates. There are two empirical relations, and uh, this is related to what scales one is looking at, etc. cetera. Uh, but the key driver for this project was that it would be nice to be able to add more clouds to this sample of resolved um, uh, galactic clouds here. Now, this is actually difficult to do because uh, if we want to uh, use dust measurements, uh, it's, it's difficult to get uh, data at the same quality, uh, at the same level of quality locally. And the reason is that uh, if we look at our Milky Way, we are really only looking at the, the most immediate neighborhood with uh, extinction mapping where we can do this uh, to the highest level of, uh, of precision. Um, everything is contained in this little circuit here, so this may not even be really representative for uh, the star formation overall. And of course, if we look at, uh, um, uh, if we think of our perspective in the in the plane of the Milky Way, we see lots of uh, clouds superimposed on, on top of one another. This is very nice image here by the Planck satellite, is a, a view of the galactic plane. Taurus Aurigas on the left hand side here, that's of course 
the region that Lee has worked on a lot. Um, at the same time, one could think that it, it would be nice to go to extragalactic observations to have a, to obtain a larger sample of clouds. Uh, but this has been uh, um, very difficult to do in the continuum because of sensitivity limitations. And so these studies, uh, um, important as they absolutely are, have been limited uh, uh, to CO. I just give one example here. This is from the PhD thesis of Chris Fazy, where we used the CO221 with ALMA and NGC300 in the southern sky uh, to obtain a census of uh, molecular, uh, resolved molecular clouds in this, in this galaxy. But this basically uh, relies on, on CO observations and then depends on things like chemistry across the galaxy, uh, metallicity, um, and, and other factors, molecular excitation. Uh, Etc. Um, however, the SMA actually provides a new and unique opportunity to remedy that, and this is uh, something that is uh, that hasn't been very visible uh, because it's it's uh, this is due to an upgrade of the SMA uh, that is uh, effectively a wideband upgrade. So the the observatory still looks the same as before, uh, but it has become a lot more powerful. We will see another example for how a wideband upgrade can change our view of star formation in um, the talk by Jaime Vargas Gonzalez on Thursday. And uh, I'm sure we will see more examples of this uh, throughout the meeting as examples of the recent observational progress. Um, and the, the target and the key to this project are actually on uh, this view of the, 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 the galactic plane taken by the Planck satellite, uh, because Planck directly uh, detects not just uh, clouds in the foreground, like the California cloud, Taurus Auriga, but there's also a detection of M31 directly on this image here, right next to structure in the, um, uh, in the CMB. So it's actually really a, a very nice image. And the key really is that we can now observe this unresolved dust emission, uh, this thermal emission here that Planck sees toward M31. Now, this is done with the submillimeter array in a, um, uh, in a large program, uh, the SMA Andromeda Dust and Molecular Gas Survey, which is now in its third year. And I will show some early signs and prospects uh, for this project. First of all, the, uh, the SMA really is perfect for imaging GMCs in M31 because uh, of the geometry, the relative proximity of this galaxy and the, the sensitivity to spatial scales. Uh, we get a resolution of roughly 10 parsec, which is, which is fantastic, of course, for, for GMCs. Uh, the primary beam and UV coverage is such that we get a maximum angular scale of about 100 parsec, uh, which is also perfect for imaging GMCs. Um, we've just been benefiting uh, of the, the latest upgrade uh, in terms of sensitivity, now observing with a bandwidth of 48 gigahertz. At, at this frequency of 230 gigahertz. And at the same time, uh, we not only get the dust continuum, uh, but we also get uh, molecular lines in this band uh, with identical UV coverage, calibration, and astrometry. And I'll show, I'll show a few examples why, uh, why that's so important. Of course, on top of that, from in terms of operational considerations, uh, this is happening at a routine frequency from our Nakia. Uh, even though uh, I, I was uh, supposed uh, to be observing right now, actually, but uh, at the moment, uh, there's bad weather on Arkea. And of course, there's uh, the option to also obtain data at 345 gigahertz. The main goals of this program really are to obtain 100 individual clouds that one can then study in greater detail. This takes about one track per, uh, per cloud. Um, since it's pushing the sensitivity uh, limit even with uh, the wideband upgrade. Uh, so we, we are far from mapping the entire galaxy, but we, we can actually use Herschel to guide these observations. And the idea then is to compare CO and dust emission to then also look at star formation relations uh, and compare with ancillary data, constrained dust properties, even compare with uh, uh, extinction mapping. So as a result, the, the already, even, even though we are still actually building our sample and are in, in the third season of, of observing clouds in, in M31, we already have a couple of, of, of interesting results. 
And uh, in particular, uh, these really are the, uh, the first result dust observations of GMCs in an external disk galaxy. I'm showing one example here from actually uh, a little more than a week ago of our third observing season here, where you see on the left hand side uh, integrated CO and grayscale and uh, the continuum in, in contours. And so you see, uh, you immediately see that there's a, a nice correlation here with uh, the peak in integrated CO. Uh, there's also an, ex an extension here. There's there's an H2 region here, um, and so this is this is one example of, of uh, what these clouds look like. The beam size here is approximately uh, 12 parsec here, uh, so that that gives you an idea of what what these data look like. Um, the the project is accompanied by a survey with the VLA to obtain star formation rates from uh, free free emission and also. MMT had to spec spectroscopy to additionally study uh, the impact of metallicity. So we are still building the sample for the main science goals, but we had some early science, uh, which I will briefly show uh, on, on this comparison between uh, dust and, and CO. I would like to highlight the advantage of having, uh, which of course is now uh, available in general with uh, such observations, of having the continuum together with um, the molecular line observations, in this case, CO isotopologues. So there are two examples for clouds here, uh, where in this case, uh, the, the blue contour lines is the continuum, green is uh, 12 CO, and the, the red contour lines is uh, 13 CO. Um, and since the sen sensitivity is so high driven by the continuum, we have signal to noise and 12 CO of up to 1,000. Um, the, the cloud size ratio between 13 CO and 12 CO is, is 75%. So there's a lot of information, even in the CO isotopic. And we occasionally even detect C18O. Uh, the first uh, result of this, uh, um, uh, of this survey has been the direct comparison of the dust emission with uh, the integrated CO. Uh, of course, we don't have a direct constraint from this on the, the gas to dust ratio. So the, uh, the most direct ratio that we can obtain is an alpha factor between either 13 CO or 12 CO um, and the continuum dust mass. Uh, so that's an equivalent to the, uh, to the X factor. And the result has been actually a, a very consistent set of measurements uh, of, of alpha, and it's it's actually interesting that so far when you look at this plot, this is showing these measurements with a range of reasonable temperatures, so it's actually very well constrained for, for many of the clouds. Um, uh, the result really has been uh, that it's very consistent with uh, galactic values, and uh, we do not find much evidence yet of uh, galactocentric trends, for example. Uh, so the preliminary conclusion from this comparison really is that the, the alpha CO is, is similar to, to galactic clouds and also the uh, isotopic abundance ratio um, uh, comparing 13 CO and C18O is similar. However, there's likely additional information in the scatter, which we will study in greater detail. In particular, some of these sources uh, may of course, not be so, so. Some of the the outliers here, one of the most extreme outliers, uh, turns out to be a background galaxy behind M31. So that there's a little bit of sample uncertainty for uh, for a few of these sources. Okay, and then finally, my my seventh point, uh, uh, just to, to highlight that these results will really place Milky Way and extragalactic studies of GMCs on the same footing. To show this, we can actually look at um, the Orion molecular clouds here seen uh, by the Planck satellite at 217 gigahertz. And we could actually, we can simulate what these clouds would look like if scaled to the, uh, to the first of all, to the declination of M31 and uh, to the distance of M31, and then uh, in a simulated observation with the UV coverage of the SMA. And in the subcompact configuration, uh, the result looks like this. Um, which, of course, for the galactic astronomers is a bit of a disappointing view because we obviously lose quite a bit of, of information here. Uh, but in an extra galactic context, it's great that one, first of all, detects the, the continuum at all and actually even resolves Orion A and B. The, the contours here are 
uh, effectively, given decent conditions, uh, uh, the first contour here would be a single track with the SMA. And then doubling that to two tracks uh, is the second contour, and four tracks uh, is the third contour. So one is really at the cusp of uh, detecting major fractions of these clouds. Sorry, Jan. You've, uh, sorry, Jan, you have exceeded two minutes <laughs> of time. All right. Okay. Uh, I, I, I will, that's fine. I'm actually uh, arrived at my summary, so I will, I will just leave up my, my summary. So thanks for your attention. All right, let's thank Jan. Any questions in person? Yeah, we have a question. Uh, Jan, can you hear me? He's not responding. Yes. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Um, so I wanted to ask about uh, the, the spatial filtering uh, a bit. Uh, what fraction of the dust is recovered in these SMA observations compared to, say, whatever single dish surveys you have? If you looked at that, do we know then what fraction of the dust emission in Andromeda is coming from uh, molecular clouds? So this is indeed something uh, that we started to look into. Uh, that I don't have the final number for this yet because the, uh, the, the spatial coverage is, um, is, is very different uh, uh, if you compare this to, to Hershey. Uh, but indeed, that would be a, an interesting comparison, including actually at higher signal to noise uh, with uh, the CO data comparing to, to the CO dish data. All right, uh, any more questions? I probably have a question for you, Jan. Uh, it's a very nice proposal to look into uh, M31. How do you think it compares with the uh, gas and star formation rates in uh, large and small Magellanic cloud? So there's been a lot of work done on the Connecticut law in these, uh, you know, outside Milky Way nearby clouds. How does like M31 results compare with them? So yeah, that's that's a great question. I think that's that's really something uh, one can now try to to bring into uh, this this overall context. If we're going to nearby galaxies, the first step is uh, of course the, the Magellanic clouds, and indeed this this has been looked into um, in, in, from various different perspectives. Um, I think the um, uh, given the more extreme metallicity, we we, will, uh, we are probing a different range. In, uh, in terms of, of star formation relations, looking at the at the Magellanic clouds, of course, it depends a bit on where uh, one is looking, but the this gives us even more range in, 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 in metallicity. And so, my my suspicion would be that there is uh, uh, an overlap if if we think of the the, the, the galactic clouds, the M thirty one clouds, and uh, clouds in in, uh, in in the in the Magellanic clouds. Uh, where um, we have properties that are in common, and then we have uh, extremes that are covered only by um, uh, individual objects in each of these. So I think this is highly complementary, and yes. uh, this will be important to see in more detail. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's all thank Jan once again for the next talk. Our uh, next speaker is going to be in person. Daniel uh, Seffried from University of Cologne. He's going to talk about synthetic polarization observation. Okay, yeah, uh, thanks. And it's actually quite nice to give a talk while standing and not while sitting on the chair. And so I would like to uh, talk a bit about uh, synthetic dust polarization observations and what we can actually learn about it um, um, concerning magnetic fields in magnetic clouds. And yeah, to give you a short um, introduction or recap. Um, so modeling molecular clouds is, as we have also seen before by various talks, still a quite challenging task because you have to consider multi-scale physics. We have to consider the chemical evolution they got in order to get the thermodynamics right. And also of course, magnetic fields. And concerning these magnetic fields from the observational aspect, there has been really an extremely growing number of um, dust polarization observations over the past yeah, decade or even two. For example, the um, yeah, Taurus molecular cloud shown here on the right-hand side, um, um, observed with Planck. And in order to make now a connection between the um, simulations and the observations, um, the simulate 
simulating the clouds themselves is not alone, but uh, is not sufficient, but we really need also somehow to make detailed comparisons by um, including relative transfer modeling. And uh, in order to do that, we of course first have to have the, the simulations at hand. And in our case, these are the silk zoom simulations. Um, which are based on the Silk project, where we model a part of a galactic disk, which you kind of, I know the mouse is working, you can see here on the top right, um, seen from edge on, um, which has Milky Way properties. We drive turbulence in these clouds, in these um, disks by injecting supernova. And the specific thing here is that we include a chemical network for the formation of H2 and also CO and some other light species. And of course, we also include then magnetic fields. And then what we do is we pick out individual Mariaka clouds, which are forming in this setup, and then we resolve those clouds with a resolution of roughly 0.1 parsec, which you can kind of see here. And you have seen this already beforehand. These clouds have very complex structures. And just in order to demonstrate how complex these uh, things actually are, here just a short overview of the very same cloud. So if you do this in the typical way as an observer would do it, in a projection, top left, you see clumps and filaments all over the place. If you do this in a 3D rendering, top right, you see really filaments all over the place and large density, uh, low density voids, which are a bit shown in blue. And if you do this in a printout, you see all, all of a sudden sheets all over the place. So exactly the, the, the things which Andy um, was looking for uh, in, in this talk uh, in this morning. And of course, these, this very complicated structure has, of course, also implications for observations. And uh, if you want to have a bit uh, a look on this, I can recommend you to the poster from um, uh, Stefano Ebagezio, who is looking at uh, line emission um, maps from these clouds, both when you include feedback and also uh, when you artificially would suppress uh, feedback. And, um, we want to investigate here, for example, whether you can use line ratios to determine the evolutionary stage of such, such clouds. And also what we can learn from these feedback bubbles when we really would observe them. However, coming now back again to the dust polarization observations, what we again do here is we take our simulations, we implement a very simple model for, for dust, that means as simple as it can be, we basically have a passive species which is advected with uh, our gas flow. That means we assume a fixed dust to gas ratio, and that's more or less it for the moment. And then we plug in details uh, in a moment, which has the advantage that we can do also some parameter studies concerning dust properties. And we do this, we implement the dust using Polaris. So Polaris is a fully self-consistent dust polarization radiative transfer code, which was developed by Stefan Reisel in, um, um, and collaborators in Kiel. And it applies the radiative torque alignment theory developed by the group around Alex Lazarian. And we plug in here a standard dust model, it means standard size distribution um, following a, a standard power law distribution. And then what we do is, that we model the line emission, or the, sorry, the dust emission for a couple of wavelengths in the infrared regime. And we also include realistic noise, which we adapted to Planck and blast pole observations, for example, depending on the wavelength, which we are considering. And the first thing which we of course can ask ourselves is, what is the influence of noise? And you can see that by comparing the left image, the no noise image with the central image, the with noise image. And of course, you see that immediately polarization vectors get randomized in the low density uh, regions here. We can improve this situation a bit by um, convolving the image. That will then result in the fact that here the, the um, polarization pattern match again better the no noise image. However, we still see large deviations, in particular in regions where we have very low column densities roughly below maybe one solar mass per square parsec. Or if I express this in, in intensities, where the intensity is lower than two times the noise level. This seems a very um, intuitive and, and, and trivial result. Um, however, this is really also the first time that we could check this with a 3D simulation combined with then the dust radiative transfer. So it's nice that this 
very simple assumptions really also hold then. Now that we know where we can trust our dust polarization observations, we can actually ask ourselves, what do we actually see? And in order to do that, we compare the dust polarization vectors with a line of sight averaged magnetic field. And what we take here and what we find is basically that the dust polarization vectors represent best the mass weighted magnetic field, which is shown in this integral on the right side. So that means for us that the dust polarization towards molecular clouds probe preferentially the dense structures of molecular clouds and not so much the diffuse for background. And what we also find is that the polarization observations actually measure the field direction with an accuracy of let's say five to 10 degree roughly. However, this brings us to the next point. We measure the dense regions. That also means that in these dense regions, the dust must still be relatively well aligned with the magnetic field. And that means for us that um, we need here a sufficient amount of radiation, which can then actually lead to the alignment of the dust. And the great thing about Polaris is now that it really delivers us dust size dependent information about the alignment. So for each dust grain, we can decide depending on its grain size, whether it is aligned at this very spot in the, in the space or not. And in order, when we do this, we find that up to particle densities of about a thousand particles per cc, even the smallest grains, and I show in the graph on the bottom right, the, the size of the smallest grains which are still aligned, even to this densities of a thousand grains are still aligned. And this corresponds roughly to an AV of three. And that means in this range, rut alignment is still efficient. However, if you then go towards higher densities, like 10,000 particles per cc, we see that this um, alignment decreases, the smallest grains are not very well aligned anymore. And that actually also very matches very, very well with these depolarization holes, which we see in the very dense cores um, in actual observations. However, we cannot really resolve the dense cores here. Nonetheless, so we think that dust is relatively well aligned in a molecular cloud. However, of course, we see regions of depolarization. And one other reason which was suggested um, to lead to this depolarization could be strongly tangled magnetic field lines. And in order to explore this, we just measured the plane of sky variation of a magnetic field along the line of sight. So we go along the line of sight and we measure how much the magnetic field in the plane of sky varies around. And we um, summarize this by this um, sigma b parameter, which is basically the angular dispersion. And then we kind of correlate this angular dispersion of the magnetic field simply with the polarization degree, which you see in the two upper panels. And you see that there is a clear anti-correlation between the B field variation and the polarization degree. And this is shown even more um, clearly in the lower panels where the, uh, this um, quantitative correlation is even stronger. And that basically shows us that at least on cloud scales, the depolarization is mainly due to tangled magnetic field lines and not so much due to a misaligned dust. So now that we have explored a bit what we learned from the dust polarization observations, we can also go then a step further. What can we actually learn from the, the physical results which we see and one Huge step which was taken here um, came with, then with the Planck Observatory, um, which showed that basically um, magnetic fields seem to be perpendicular to uh, dense uh, structures, which is shown, for example, um, uh, schematically here. And um, yeah, if we look at this in our simulation, we see this behavior in both 3D top panel and in 2D. And we basically find that there is a switch from a parallel field orientation to perpendicular around densities of 100 to 1,000 and column densities above 10 to the 21, shown in the bottom right panel. And what we also, however, observe is that this flip only occurs if we have a strong magnetic field. Um, and with strong, I mean here something like 
three to five microgauss, which roughly corresponds to the strength of the mean magnetic field in our uh, Milky Way, or expressed in terms of the mass to flux ratio. We need here a subcritical magnetic field with a mass to flux ratio around one or below. One maybe quite interesting fact is um, that if you look very closely um, to the very high column density regime, we see that there might be an indication for a second flip above maybe an AV of 20. And indeed, we saw also this flip in a recent publication, which was led by Toshara Pillai, where um, exactly this second flip also occurs in, in the observations. However, in order to make things not too easy, um, we also have to consider again observational effects, and this is now shown here. Now, this lower panel shows the same, very same molecular cloud seen from three sides. And now we see that for two sides, we actually see that flip. That means these values drop the zero line and get negative. And for the third line, we don't see it. And that basically also means that we have here really to deal with projection effects, which can really complicate the interpretation of such observational results. And also then if you look in detail at the compilation of, of these so-called um, histograms of relative, relative orientation, you see this uh, variation also in actual observations. So now we can basically say, okay, we see this flip in our simulations and in observations. What does it actually tell us? And here I would like to refer to a theory which was put forward by Juan Soler and Patrick Hennebel in 2017. And in order, and this theory basically states that in order to see the flip, we need an anisotropic and converging flow. If we now bring this back to the simulations, or if we break this up, we have a strong magnetic field. And this strong magnetic field can guide the turbulent flow in moderately dense gas. So here we create our anisotropy. If we go then to denser and denser gas, at some point, two minutes, and um, gravity takes over, and this creates our converging flow. So both things taken together lead then to this flip which we observe. And this basically means, and I would like to show you this in this slide here, in the top row, I show our results concerning the magnetic field orientation in 3D on the left side and in 2D on the right side. And the, the lower row shows the results from Dick Crutcher where he measures the magnetic field strength as a function of density or column density on the right hand side. And you see that the flip occurs exactly at the very same position as the, the, the position where the, density, uh, the magnetic field strength starts to increase. And that basically can simply be explained by the fact that on large scales, we have a dominant magnetic field, which is strong enough to guide the flow. That means it remains maybe relatively well ordered. It doesn't get bent around and therefore the density at its strength does not really increase. However, as soon as it gets subdominant, gravity takes over, it can bend around the magnetic field. You see this also in many different simulations and bending means nothing else than amplifying the magnetic field. And that means basically above a few hundred particles per cc or a column density of 20 to 21 particles per square centimeter, the magnetic field gets subdominant. And if I would have to put this in a physical scale, this is maybe around maybe one parsec. I would have to measure it more exactly, but by I, it's about one parsec maybe. And this can also be seen here in, in this very late last plot. And um, you see this filament in the very back you see really that these magnetic fields are dragged along with the filament. So they cannot really prevent anything. So the filament itself is maybe moving a bit and it just drags along the filament. It means really shows that here the, the, fit, the magnetic field alone is not um, um, dominant anymore. And this is something which we would like also to discuss then in the upcoming PP7 uh, chapter on filaments from led by Alvaro Haka. And with this, I'm running, I think, out of time and leave you here with my something. Thank you, Daniel. We have a question from Lee. Sorry. Um, how, often, how often do you see 
in like what would be molecular gas, high enough column de densities, do you see the field look like it's along the filament rather than sort of perpendicular? And is that a projection effect in 2D or is it actually, do you get cases where it's actually along the, field, along the filament? Mm, the problem is that this, this, this second flip I think you're talking about occurs at and um, so where it's again parallel to the filament, where it becomes again parallel to the filament. Is that is that what you are talking about? So, so what I'm asking about is that there are observations where many times the field is perpendicular to, to the, the filament, yeah. Dense gas. Mm. But in a few cases, it looks like it's along mm. the 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 you know, like in the in the plant. You can see one of the th things like that mm. in Taurus. And I was assuming that those are mostly projection effects of yeah. the field bending around, but is that right? Um, there are these, basically these two answers. First, it can be indeed a projection effect, as you can see in the bottom panel. So even though it is really perpendicular in 3D, in 2D it might appear it, but if the, the field is not strong enough in the first place, then you can look at the, the bot top panel, then it may see basically re can remain parallel to it. So you need a strong enough field to really see this. And then it's really also normally always kind of getting perpendicular. Right, question from Noria. Yeah, forgive my ignorance, but do the, your results depend on the optical properties of the particles that you have? Like you have silicates and graphite, but what kind of silicate? <laughs> um, we are working on, on that. So to try to, Im, to plug in more different dust uh, um, um, species and dust models. I think overall the, the orientation of the polarization vectors is relatively robust. The polarization de degree is the thing I think which depends more on the dust properties. Any other questions from the audience? I have a question for you, Daniel. It's nice uh, the simulations are actually now, very relevant, especially with Sophia's Hawk plus observations coming in. Uh, I'm just uh, thinking that uh, when you show the flip uh, at certain column densities, uh, have you compared what's the magnetic field strength uh, during those flips? Um, Although you showed a plot where you compared with Crutch's uh, log uh, with the density versus B field. It would be interesting to actually see how the magnetic field strength uh, compares in the simulations during the flip. Mm -hmm. I think actually we see, a, I think we're not the only ones, we see a relatively shallow increase with the magnetic field with density. And um, yeah, in particular at these low densities, it remains relatively flat and then it starts to increase I, I would guess it's it should actually match relatively well the um, the bottom left plot of of the crutcher here. Um, so right. it it should not maybe change too much, but but a bit in the, until the flip occurs. Yeah, and uh, one more thing is uh, like of course your dust uh, modeling and properties uh, you're looking at more uh, in terms of cloud scales, but if you if you go into core scales where density is really high, do these dust uh, particles actually still uh, have the same uh, similar uh, polarization em emission, but where we are actually seeing now with ALMA where sometimes it's scattering and all of these. So how does that relate uh, your simulations? <laughs> um, I think Polaris is not yet able to deal with Gathering, if I'm not completely mistaken. All right. So this yeah. is something which has to be looked at in the future. But I think this happens more than on, on almost disk scales. Yes. So um, probably not not the core scales. We should be fine there. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Let's thank Daniel again and all the other speakers.